Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, November 22nd, 2014. This is episode 1137. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by FreshBooks, the number one cloud accounting solution that helps millions of entrepreneurs and small business owners save time billing and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash techguy and join over 5 million users running their business hassle-free. And by Jack Irwin. Jack Irwin sells men's shoes made from the finest materials at honest prices, and they ship them right to their door. Check out their shoe collections at jackirwin.com slash twit. That's J-A-C-K-E-R-W-I-N dot com slash twit. Oh, well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, and all that jazz. Smartphones, too. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number to call if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion. 8888-ASK-LEO, toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. 200 stations strong, 200 cities across the fruited plain, and if you wish to call, please do. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'll talk about anything. I will talk about anything with a chip in it, any digital technology at all. Been playing with a couple of new toys. <laughs> There's always new toys. And we're getting ready, you know, uh, Friday is Black Friday. The day after Thanksgiving. I don't know if it's the biggest shopping day of the year anymore. I don't think so. I think people shop all year round. And now, of course, all the stores that uh, normally have these long lines waiting uh, out front on uh, Black Friday, now they've made it all week long, haven't they? <laughs> A word of caution on Black Friday. Yeah, usually the things that are most discounted are not the most recent things in the world. Um, they're often, you know, the last year's model or a discontinued model or... Uh, a particularly cheap model. So don't rush to the store and buy it just because the price is low. You might want, especially when it, especially when it comes to technology, you might want to do read some reviews, think about it a little bit first. We'll talk a little more about Black Friday deals, and I'll I'll invite uh, the um, the chat room to uh, chime in and you to chime in, and if you found some particularly good deals, we'll share them with you in the show today. The toys I've been playing with, two things. One is from Neil Young, the rock and roll uh, singer and performer and songwriter. Neil Young. His Pono player. I'll talk a little bit about that. We've been talking with Scott Wilkinson about high-res music, high-quality music, effectively master tape recordings. The Pono is one of those. And then I just got yesterday, I'm excited to say, <laughs> the biggest darn Android phone of them all. <laughs> this thing is huge. Google's new Nexus 6, which is now entering stores. T-Mobile has it. I think AT&T has it. Although I understand AT&T is recalling it <laughs> already. Something they put on it, I would guess, because I haven't had any problems with... Uh, this is the Google edition, the Google Play edition of the uh, Nexus 6. What a nice phone. I, I think a beautiful phone. I haven't really uh, finished banging on it yet. In fact, I just set it up, finished setting it up this morning. By setting it up, you know how it is with a new phone. you got to get all your apps on there, arranged just so, all the screens the way you like them and all that stuff. So I've, I'm done with that. And, of course, that's a lousy time to measure battery life because you're sitting there fiddling with it for hours at a time. It's going to get the worst battery life ever. I like to give it a few days before I really start to assess battery life. So I'm not going to say anything about it yet. I'm a little concerned. I mean, I think increasingly battery life, to me is one of the number one features on smartphones. Are, are, do you agree with me on that? We spend a lot of time talking about silly things, like how much RAM they have or how fast a processor. We certainly talk a lot about the screen size and density. That may be the number one differentiator. And then you can debate Android versus iOS versus Windows Phone versus BlackBerry until you're blue in the face. But I'll assume that you've picked one. But I do note something that's happened. We are getting bigger and bigger phones. Even Apple 
who for a long time had the smallest phones on the market for the last few years, finally gave in and made us a five and a half inch iPhone 6 Plus. So the five inch and up phones are really becoming the thing. The Galaxy Note 4 from uh, Samsung, that's almost six inches, not quite. What is it, 5.7, I think? Um, the LG G3, five and a half inches. The OnePlus One, which I like a lot, five and a half inches. But the king, the king of them all now, uh, well, for a long time, it's been the uh, Nokia Lumia 1520, a full six-inch phone running Windows phone. A lot of people never got to play with that. I loved that phone, by the way, because uh, they it was Windows phone, and they were stuck in the Android or iOS world. So this is the biggest Android phone out there right now. It's almost, I think it's 5.96 inches. It's called the Nexus 6. Oh, it's on all the carriers. It's Google. It's and one of the reasons people like the Nexus line of phones from Google is because it's pure Google. There's nothing now. The carriers might put some stuff on it. In fact, I bet they do. But it's a but it's generally not a uh, and it's an unmodified Android. In this case, Android 5.0 Lollipop, the newest Android, which has a new look, but also some f new features. Some of which might improve battery life and so forth. But what's interesting is when you get a phone this big, what, what, what else gets bigger? Well, there's more inside, right? There's more space inside, so you can make a bigger battery. And all of these big phones now, including phones like the Droid Turbo, which is it has a giant battery. It's, it, they say, this is, all, it, this is Verizon only. All about the battery. Because I think people realize the battery's got an important feature. I, it, a phone is no good if it dies at 5 p.m., right? You want, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, of course, you can plug it in at the office and keep it charging and so forth. But I think, really, you want to unplug it when you get up in the morning, let's say 7 o'clock. Plug it in when you go back to bed at 11 o'clock. You want it to run 18 hours without charging. I don't care if it's down to 10% after 18 hours, but you want it to run 18 hours without charging in between charges. And there are almost no phones that will do that, no smartphones. Well, one way to fix it, put in a bigger battery, and they're doing that now with these giant phones. But guess what else they're doing? This is frustrating. They're putting in much higher resolution screens. This is 2550 by 1440. That is a quad HD screen. More than 500 dots per inch, much more than you could see. I mean, if, if Apple made a big deal of retina displays that were 200, 200 dots per inch, these are 500 dots per inch. This is super retina. And the problem with all those dots on the screen is it uses up battery. So you you get a giant phone with a giant screen with giant resolution and a giant battery. What do you get? Nothing. You get your battery life back to nothing. Back to 12 to 15 hours. That's not enough. I think one plus one, even as hard as it is to get this one plus one phone, it is the king of the battery life. Because even though it's a big phone with a big battery, they didn't go for the quad HD. They just made a regular HD display. And that alone was enough to give it 20 hours of battery life. Hallelujah. Well, we'll see. I have a feeling because this uh, Nexus 6 has, yes, that quad HD screen, and I'm, I'm afraid it's just going just gonna to zap us in battery life. We shall see. We shall see. Uh, there are a few things I do like. For instance, dual front-facing speakers. There aren't there. There's a handful of phones that do, that do this. The HTC One does it. And it's how it should be, right? You're looking at a movie... You're looking at the phone sideways. The speakers are on the left and right. They're stereo. That's how it should be. None of this cheesy little tiny speaker in the back. So that's nice. This is made by Motorola, so it has some of the features of the Moto X and the to Droid uh, phones. But not all of them because it's Google, and so they took out a lot of the weird stuff. Like the fa uh, my, my, uh, <laughs> my, my Droid Turbo, my, you can change the launch phrase. You know how you talk to your phone? On my Droid Turbo, I say, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And that's a good launch phrase. Because any other launch phrase, some guy on the radio might say it, and then your phone wakes up, and it's very annoying. You know what I'm talking The one that begins with OK, mm -hmm. and then and then concludes with Google. I'm, I See, if I say that, people say I should be editing the radio show. I should be bleeping it, because it's waking up their phones. <laughs> so I'm going to have to say something like the phrase that begins with OK and ends with Google. And then it won't wake up the phone, right? But that's the phrase you have to use with this phone. And I, that's disappointing. I like saying, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Or something else.
We shall see. We shall see. I will review this a uh, little more uh, next week. I'll also talk a little more in the show about high-res music. The joy of listening to a, a, a file that is effectively the same as the master recording. Isn't that nice? Wouldn't that be nice? The same sound that the artists are hearing as they record the music in the studio. Wouldn't that be cool? We'll also talk about anything you with a chip in it, anything you've got a mind to talk about. Would give me a ring now, okay? Your call's next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, do you want to go to a cheap trick tonight? Sorry sure. Okay. What I songs do they it. sing? Oh, my God, all of them. <laughs> Get that something. I'm a California man. I don't know their music. Are you I know. Kidding? I know there's a guy in shorts that runs around in a schoolboy outfit. No, that's not cheap trick. <laughs> no, one of them might wear shorts. What does he wear? No, he wears a funny little hat. I funny little hat, that's it. Funny little hats, guys. Uh, that's Bunny Carlos. He's not in the band any longer, or for now. Well, the that's drummer. cheap. Uh, they're playing a trick on us. Robin Zander, Rick Nielsen. Checks. checks. He always wears checks. checks. That's right, that's right. Checker. Yeah, I'm not a fan of music from the 80s, particularly. What? It's the 70s, too. You know who we're seeing? Okay, wait a minute. Now, get ready for this. <laughs> Did I tell you? I finally found the tickets, or actually, we got them reprinted for Fleetwood Mac. Uh, That's December 3rd at the uh, Oracle Arena. Take me. I'm excited, because, and, and I've seen him before, and I just, they do a great show. Mick Fleetwood, the last time I saw him, has, puts in a suit that is a drum kit on his body. And, he, and the rest of the band goes back and has a smoke, while he just goes like this. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> it's really I've funny. To, I've got to get into that show. If anyone gets sick, I'll use that ticket. Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, okay, so then, and so I bought those because I wanted to see them. And, and you know what we do is, is Lisa and I will think, well, who do we want to see? And then are they touring? And then I knew Fleetwood Mac, this is, they were touring. It might be one of their last. They're all together. Um, and then I read in the New York Times that Stevie Wonder is touring, doing songs in the key of life. The entire... <gasps> set chills two days later at the oracle coliseum we're going to see him Ugh, just get it i mean what can Buy you do a house down you there. have to yeah i'm gonna move in <laughs> moving in leo laporte the tech guy cheap trick so they're playing tonight in the san francisco bay area and you're going heather Harmon. yeah I mean, yeah kim wonderly you're a fan see? of the the older uh older bands the 80s bands any band that's Awesome. Awesome. You're a fan of you're right. You like young you like uh, young bands too. You 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 have very eclectic musical taste. Oh. Yeah. Okay, in fact I look to you we all have that in life, don't we? Somebody that we look to for their um musical acumen, that the, the people that will recommend, oh, you've got to hear this band, they're great. And you you, you want to have people like that in your life because then it introduces you to new music. And I think you're like that. Oh, thanks yeah. so much. I never heard of this this cheap trick band, huh? They're gonna be big. <laughs> They are gonna big in Japan. <laughs> they're going, yeah. They're big in Japan. They're going places. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, and and this comes this 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 reminds me of this Pono player because, you know, the traditional thinking, and I think the music industry believes this, is that people's musical tastes are frozen at the age of twenty seven. That it's pretty much you know in your in your early twenties you decide what you like and then you just keep listening to that like cheap trick for the rest of your life. Oh, interesting. But I think that there are some people who um, it, are open to new music and want to hear new music. Because, you know, familiarity is nice. It's nice to hear the old songs again. It's like I can't eat steak and potatoes every meal for the rest of my life. But sometimes you want something fresh, something new, something different. But a lot of the new bands that you love remind you of some of the old bands, and maybe that's... Maybe that's uh, it, yeah. Mm, of it. But I think what's happened, though, a little bit is... Uh, it started for me with Napster. Because I was frozen in my musical taste. But then Napster came out in my 30s, I guess it was, maybe 40s. And um, and this was a chance to hear old music you hadn't heard in a while. But then you start to hear other music. And, of course, it was illegal. You're illegally downloading music. The music industry shut it down, particularly Metallica. Lars Ulrich, the drummer of Metallica, just did not like Napster. He sued them, put him out of business. But it started something. And I think it, he might have been wrong, a little misguided, because... And this is the argument for piracy in general. Sometimes it can actually ignite a fire that ends up creating a new music listener. And I think that's what happened to me is I got back into music. You know why I got out of it? I was a DJ. <laughs> Worst thing to do. You know, I thought when I was in college, I got into radio. I thought, oh, 
be so cool, man. I could play my music, play my tunes. <laughs> I'd be so great to have that as a job, man. That'd be so cool. And I got a job, and then they tell you what to play over and over and over, and pretty soon you hate music. The 80th time I played the Bee Gees Staying Alive was that's it. It was over for me. <laughs> I wasn't ever going to listen to music again, except at work. And so Napster reignited that. And now I have to say this Pono player has, has done the same for me because suddenly instead of hearing this highly digitally compressed music, these MP3s, where, where you know, they sound fine. Heck, we used to listen to songs on the transistor radio. So music communicates even in a kind of low quality but there's something to listening to music, master tape quality music, on a nice stereo with a good pair of headphones. And the experience is lovely. Going to a concert's like that if it's not too loud. It's, it, you're hearing the real music, and it's wonderful. No compression, you know? That's so funny. I just saw something that billed itself as CD quality audio, and I'm like, wait a minute. That is not the hallmark. That's not the... <laughs> That's not the benchmark. We want better. <laughs> well, it's an improvement. It's a start. It's not compressed, right? Um, it's still digitized, but it's not compressed. The the are you, Probably what you saw was a couple of new music services. Tidal is one, and Deezer is the other. Deezer oh. is going to stream, just like Spotify does, RDO does stream music Pandora, but instead of streaming it in highly compressed fashion, which all those services do, Deezer will offer a CD quality, uh -huh. uncompressed version. But you'll have to have a lot of bandwidth to play that back okay. without a lot of hesitation. Good uh, to know. And it's going to be twice as much, $20 a month. I think we're starting to see people trying to innovate because everybody wants to make sure that music doesn't go away. We want to make sure artists get paid, new, new artists get a chance to make a living. Uh, and I think there are ways to do that. And I don't think actually the Spotify is so very bad for that. But uh, right, music industry seems to. Uh, anyway, Pono, I'm excited. This is Neil Young's idea to bring back high quality listening, better than CD quality, master tape quality listening. And uh, it's exciting. It's fun. And I've been listening to some of my old albums, my favorite albums in CD quality uh, or not. I'm sorry, not CD quality, better than CD quality. Usually a 96. So CD is 44,100 samples per second. You know, they slice it like a piece of cheese, like bologna. They, they slice it 44,100 times a second. That seems like a lot, doesn't it? And then each slice can be a number from 1 to 65,000. It's what they call 16-bit. So it can be from 1 to 65,000. So slice 1 is 48. Slice two is 4,500. Slice three. So those, that amplitude combined with how frequently they slice it makes a wave, which is what music is, is a wave. So they can, it, your ear reassembles it into a wave. But it turns out having higher resolution, more than 65,000 choices, maybe let's try 2 million or 4 billion choices, giving more, more resolution, just like a higher resolution screen looks, you don't see the dots. It, it, it kind of looks more real. The same thing with the music, higher, having a higher sample rate, and then sampling it more often. Uh, so higher resolution in the samples, but in sampling, instead of 44,100 times, maybe 92,000, 96,000, or as much as 192,000. So that's the recording quality that's used in studios frequently, as much as 192,000 samples times 24 bits. So these, you can, there now that, Bandwidth is high and storage is ample. We don't need to squish this stuff down into tiny size as much. And so you can go, and there are stores uh, online, hdtracks.com. Pono Music has its own, ponomusic.com. Uh, Bowers and Wilkins, the Society of Sound. There are lots of places where you can get studio quality masters. It, the same, if, if it was recorded digitally, the same file, the, the digital recording, after the mix down, right? Uh, of the digital recording, and if and if it was recorded analog on tape, as many older albums were, then high quality digital remastering at 96, 24, or you know 48 in, in, in the worst case 48, 24, and they just they, there's something about it. Maybe it's in my mind. Maybe it's psychological. Some people think it is. It just feels more open, more detailed. The problem is most computers can't play it back. And most players, your iPod can't play it back. You need a high-quality digital-to-analog converter. And that's what Neil Young is trying to uh, get people to listen to. Higher-quality music on this Pono player, because it can do that full resolution. Um, it's exciting. I feel like we're, we're, 
for me, it was like that Napster moment when I when I got back into music. And I started with listening to all my oldies, the ones I like. I got Peter Gabriel's So. What a great album. Thriller, Michael Jackson's Thriller. Great album. Nora Jones, Come Away With Me. Paul Simon's uh, uh, Graceland. These are great albums, beautifully recorded. And when you hear the master tape, wow. Hmm. I think. I should. I'm, I'm old. Maybe younger ears. Maybe younger ears. I said we'd take calls, but I can't. It's I'm, I'm excited about this. I'm sorry. I, we will take calls. I'm going to take a break. We have to, but we'll be back. Your call's next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Um, so interesting. I want to get you. So I've got with when John's heard this. John's heard them. Oh, your call's not next because Santa Claus is next. Dang it. <laughs> hey, Pete in Brooklyn's asking about calibrating a TV if you want to include Good. that we, in we the can put Pete. You want, you want to take Pete, Scott? Sure, sure. You're not I was new. getting ready to talk more about Pono. And well, stuff. we can talk did a little bit about that, and then we'll learned? go to Pete. Yeah, it's not in the studio. I did get the Pono. Oh, man. Good stuff. You know what, though? I'm very disappointed. I got the headphone amp, the Fio. Yeah. There's something wrong. It's grungy. Ooh, now, they, like, the FIO is hysterical because they ship it with all these other extra ICs yeah. so you can try different amps. So I might have to bring it in and pop in some other ICs. They actually ship it with chips? Yeah, and little chip puller. Oh, man. And it's only like 100 bucks, but it's a headphone amp. It's beautiful, too. It's a mach machined aluminum case. Who made it? F-double-I-O. -F they're, very, they're very good. Everybody uh, likes their DAX. Um, but I was disappointed because I put the... Uh, I put the H, the Hitman, Hi-Fi Man, HT 560s, on there, and I was hearing stuff not good. The story is on clipping. I was hearing clipping, even if I turned Ooh. it down. So I have to, I have to mess with it. Line out of the Pono too. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm kind of overblown on your TV. Should I turn down something no, here? No, it's not you. I don't think you're, you're a little bright. Are you? Where are you? I'm in Santa Cruz. Oh, you lucky dog. I know. I took a took a little weekend and got out of Dodge. Get out of Dodge, man. Now you look good. You got a blue bar over your mouth, but other than that, you look uh, great. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> I have to say that we talk about all this <clears throat> stuff and higher quality music and different quality recordings. Philharmonic Live. Nothing treats your ears. I mean, it's so. What's good. Philharmonic Live? Oh, going to, going to see them. Oh, I agree. Yeah. You know, I, I, I went to a Philharmonic concert last night, and that was what originally what I was going to suggest talking about. So, the, my most amazing experience ever was going to the Lucas Ranch, where they were recording the music for um, that Sony game. Yeah, you and I went to that with with Scott and um, and our friend who is the uh, arranger, and um, and but then going and sitting in the orchestra. Which sounds amazing because you're yeah. now you're really hearing it. You're hearing 100% yep. of the sound. But I have to say, if you go in the studio, remember this, Scott? You go in the studio oh, yeah. with those beautiful Rebel speakers. Uh, B&Ws. Or they're B&Ws. Were they B&Ws in there? I'm pretty sure. Oh. Anyway, going in there and a beautiful soundboard, it sounded amazing. One thing you couldn't hear because they had the drums in a, in a, in a room. They had isolated some of the, and yeah. I think the horns were isolated. No, so, I don't think so. Something else was isolated. So going in the studio, you're hearing it all. And it's uh, so recording cape technology is good enough to really give you because even on playback, it sounded unbelievable. So yeah. much better than anything you've ever heard uh, on yeah. your stereo. And and your Pono player and this high res audio gets you closer to that. It's a lot closer. Anything. Yeah. Although the Onkyo, I want to say my Onkyo with the TI um, uh, DAX mm -hmm. is very good. And I have some, I have my. I can't remember which speakers I'm using in the in the office. I think it's the uh, Aperians. But I have a 5.1 Aperians with a nice sub, and it sounds yeah. phenomenal. I'm blasting oh, music all man. the time now. I'll bring in the Pono tomorrow. Yeah. And I'll let, uh, I'm will let i going to let Heather listen to that. Good. She needs to listen. I'll bring in the headphone amp and the Pono, and you guys can listen to it. I'll bring in the HT 560s, too. too. Yeah, it might just be I have a bad one. <laughs> It sounds like it to me. That doesn't sound right. No, because Fio's pretty good, supposedly. Might be doing something wrong. I'm taking line out of the Pono, so that shouldn't be the issue. 
And the and David Byrne's new book, everybody has to read. You have to read yeah. how music works, Scott. You have to read it. I do. You have to read it. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Wilkinson is here. He is our home theater guru, the man who does the Home Theater Geeks podcast at twit.tv and uh, edits the AVS Forum. He's their editor-in-chief there. And uh, we, we were talking high-res music, and Scott and I have off and on been talking about high-res music. We actually have a call we'll take in, in just a little bit, Scott. I'm going to get you sure. to help me on some home theater stuff. But before we do that, that um, we, we were talking about high-res music. You're a musician. See, musicians hear it. They are in the band. So you have a, is it really different when you hear the live music, when you're in the middle of the live music? It is. Yeah, it is. And there are some um, companies, in particular um, AIX Records, that records and mixes music in 5.1 channel surround and gives you the choice oh, like of that. sitting in the middle of the band or sitting in the audience where most of the music is coming from in front of you. And then what you hear in the surrounds is more like the ambience of the hall that you're in and maybe some reflections, uh, you know, of the instruments. But, they ship their uh, stuff they, on uh, Blu-ray, right? They do. Or you can download it. Okay. Okay. And it's all 2496. So it'll work in your Pono player. Yeah. But not in surround. I don't know of if the Pono does multi channel. No, that, no, now it's that I stereo. Think about it. It's left and right. It's stereo. Okay. Yeah. So you can get stereo versions at AIX too. Mark Waldrop is the guy there, and he, he mixes in two channel and in 5.1. I am going uh, over there tonight, and I'm going to buy some music. Yeah, yeah. His music, the guitar music, Lawrence Juber is a guitarist on his roster that is phenomenal. Just beautiful. Uh, some of his jazz stuff and the classical stuff, too, is really, really good. So I highly recommend it. Now, what I found in the high-res music stores is that often uh, the price of a high-res uh, album, I don't want to call them CD because you're downloading them. Right. Um, so I'll give you an example, Peter Gabriel. So, which probably in the store costs $15 for the CD and then... Maybe on iTunes was as little as ten dollars. It's only eighteen dollars in high res, so it's worth a few bucks more, I think. I think so. Not too. for everything necessarily, but certainly no. for those albums that you cherish, that you really want to hear. Now and these are a little more. These are more. This is like I'm looking at Albert Lee, "Tear It Up," the great blues guitarist, and that's thirty-five bucks. But this was these worth were it. recorded to begin with right. in high resolution. I think worth it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, many many times you'll uh, you'll get an album that was recorded on analog tape, and you'll you'll digitize it to high resolution as you were talking about earlier, and it will uh, it might not sound that much better than CD uh, because there might not have been any real high frequency information uh, or dynamic range that warrants the extra high sampling rate or bit depth that you were talking about earlier. I'm gonna get they have a high resolution audio experience sampler. There you go. 25 Check bucks. Yeah, I'm going to get that. John McEwen yep. of the uh, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, great guitarist and uh, yep. banjo player. I'm Mark get gets that. great, great players. Yeah. He, he's a musician himself, and he really knows his stuff. We were talking about this last night. I went to a symphony concert. I'm up here in the Bay Area, actually, taking a weekend off, and uh, went to hear the Monterey Symphony Orchestra. And we were talking about you know live music versus uh, recorded music. And certainly high-res recorded music gives you more of that impact, the emotional involvement that you get from live music, much more so than MP3s. Um, my friend said, you know, MP3s are kind of like the fast food of the music industry, whereas high-res or going live is like a gourmet meal. <laughs> It affects you more, and I said, you know, you're right. That's a great analogy. Yeah, I want I want a gourmet meal when I exactly. sit down and listen in the car, uh, running on the track. It doesn't sure, matter. Sure, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But when when you're actually going to sit down and listen to music, boy, and there's nothing like live. Well, let me ask you a question. I've wondered this. So you're when you're listening to a symphony, of course, you're listening to the sound unamplified, right? Unamplified. It's yeah. just straight from the violin to your ear. That's right. When you're listening to a rock band, though, you're hearing it amplified. Yes, and uh, you know, I went to see. I got a ticket to see Kinky Boots last week. Oh, the so, great uh, show by uh, Cindy oh, Lauper. The, yeah, Cindy Lauper. and everything was amplified. The pit orchestra, live orchestra, live singing on stage, which is great, but it was all amplified. Everything I was hearing was through the speakers. Did, and, now, but that's still better than recorded, isn't it? I think so. I because it's so. analog most of the all the way most, usually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was too loud, in my opinion. Yeah. The, the sound mixer was a little... Everybody <laughs> now who's performing on stage and everybody who's mixing the sound, they're all deaf. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they're going to mix it too loud, and it's a it's a vicious circle because it, as they get deafer, and I include myself as a DJ for years with big headphones yeah. turned up, you turn it up a little more, 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 you get deafer, yep, yep, you get yep. deafer, you get deafer. Just to get it what the where it was before, yeah, exactly. It's a bad habit. Kids, protect your hearing and your knees. First, <laughs> both the first to go. Absolutely. So we got a call. You want to take one? You bet. Uh, Pete's on the line from uh, Brooklyn, and he wants to know a little bit about uh, calibrating his TV. Hi, Pete. Hi, Leo. Hi, Scott. How are you guys? Welcome. What'd you get? Hey, Pete. I, uh, I got a Samsung 4K. Um, it's, I think it's the 55 HU7250. I'm jealous. I don't think it's the top That's... of the line, but... I'm jealous. You know, it's up there. I, what, you know what it was? They were given a Black Friday deal at PC Richards. I, I picked it up for like 1300 It wasn't bad. Nah, uh, I want to know about calibrating it, though, guys. You know, we calibrated my Samsung OLED. You calibrated it. I did. And you said it came from the factory if you t if you turned off showroom mode and went into, right. you know, normal mode. Home mode. Home mode. It came out of the factory pretty well calibrated, right? It was. As I recall, I'd have to go back and look at my notes, but uh, as I recall, it did come out pretty good. So the first thing to do, uh, Pete, is to... Uh, take it, uh, go into the menu system, go to the picture menu or video menu, and um, select either the movie or cinema mode. There's a the, one of the first items in that menu is going to be something called the picture mode or picture, and it's uh, it's going to be probably vivid or dynamic or something really exciting sounding, but that isn't what you want to watch at home. So you want to pick the movie or cinema mode. That's the first step. Second step, you can do yourself. You take, you get a disc like um, Spears and Munsell HD Benchmark or uh, Digital Video Essentials uh, HD Basics or the Disney Wow World of Wonder disc, and you use those discs to set your basic picture controls. And you can do this yourself. It's pretty easy. And these discs have tutorials on how to do it. Um, you set your uh, contrast, brightness, color, tint, and sharpness. That'll get you about 80% of the way towards the best possible picture this TV can produce, more or less. And then the final step, if you want to take it, is you pay somebody, typically several hundred dollars, uh, to come in and do a full calibration with uh, instruments, with, with a light meter and a colorimeter and computer, and take several hours. It gets you at, it gets you absolutely the best picture that TV can can reproduce. Now, is it worth several hundred dollars? That depends on you know your budget. Pete, what'd you, you spend on that TV? Uh, Thirteen hundred. Yeah. I'm good with the eighty percent. You know, that's much better. Yeah, than and and you know, <laughs> you, you didn't buy you know you didn't buy a ten thousand dollar TV. So exactly. Uh, you exactly. know, so I would say you know for another twenty thirty bucks, get one of these discs. And uh, set those basic picture controls yourself, and you're going to have a beautiful picture. It's just going to be gorgeous. I have to say though, because Scott is a tr you're like you're a certified calibrator, right? THX, THX certified calibrator. Yeah. Yep. So <laughs> having having a little bit of an in here, I can persuade Scott to come up and fix my TVs. And uh, <laughs> the Panasonic Viera Plasma that you calibrated. At first, I thought, wow, this is dark. Uh, it doesn't look as good as it did. But once I got used to it, it is. And, you know, you see it, things like football where the grass actually looks like grass instead of some fluorescent green thing. Yep. Uh, at first you go, what, why is the grass so dull? And then you start to get, once you get used to it, it's a huge improvement. Uh, so I do recommend it. I think it's well worth it. Hey, thanks thanks for the call, Pete. Thank you, uh, Scott Wilkinson, avsforum.com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And they're pointing out that uh, you have uh, calibration uh, discs you can download at AVS Forum as well. That's true. You know, I forgot to mention that. Bummer. No, sorry. Uh, he's still on the line, I think. Well, maybe not. No. Maybe not. He's yeah, listening, uh, I'm sure, to the podcast. There's a, um, yes, AVS Forum, there is a setup disc, disc in quotes, that you can download and burn to a disc if you want. It's called AVS HD 709. That's cool. So, That's cool. Yeah. Just search for that, and it's free. That's really nice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, the thing is, having the hardware makes a difference. You can't uh, completely trust your eye, right? 
No, well, no. You can on these on these um, setup discs. You can. You can trust. You can trust your eye to. They they put up a dis, they put up a pattern a, a picture on the screen that lets you okay take the brightness control move it up oh that's not right move it down too far oh that's not right uh, and and then sort of zero in until you get it set up and you go okay that's correct. Uh, and the same thing with the contrast control. The tint and color controls are a little more difficult to do. Um, and fortunately, in this digital age, they don't usually need to be moved that much. Um, and the sharpness control is very easy to do by eye as well. You put up a little test pattern with some lines, some black lines on gray background, typically. And when the sharpness control is up too high, those black lines have white ghosts around them. And so you just turn down the the sharpness control until those ghosts disappear and boom, the sharpness control is set properly, period. Oh, M. Heiss, uh, Mike Heiss in the chat room is saying there's also a THX calibration app for iOS and I think Android too. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I forget what it's called. My phone is not oh, with look me. It I have here. it on my I'll phone. Uh, but it's called THX, it's THX something. Uh, Mike Heiss in the... Uh, THX yeah. tune-up. Tune up. That's what it's called. Exactly right. And exactly it is. It's right. iOS and uh, Android. Now I'm curious and if um, it doesn't use the camera though. You. No. Again, this is a by eye, but it does produce the test patterns That's that neat. you need to set those basic picture controls: contrast, brightness, color, tint, sharpness. And it can and it produces them from the phone. You you plug your phone into the oh, TV. Cool. It puts it on the TV. Yeah, it puts it on the oh, TV, and cool. then you can set it up. It's really cool. I'm sorry I didn't mention that on the call. That's good. Mike well, Heiss I, I, is I will mention exactly that. correct. Yeah, that's cool. All right, take it away if you wish. Thank you very much. Be happy to. Um, H Bomb is uh, saying a caller wants to see if you guys know Audio Quest Dragonfly. I do know Audio Quest. There, it's a cable company. Um, the Dragonfly. I have to look up what the Dragonfly is. Um, let me see here. Audio Quest Dragonfly. There it is. Is it a D to A converter? That's what I would guess. Yep, it's a DAC. D digital to analog converter. Uh, I don't know that particular product, so I wouldn't be able to talk about it specifically. Um, so that's... But Audio Quest is a great company. I mean, I have no problem with that. Our Chandra in the chat room asks, how often should you uh, typically have to consider recalibration of your TV uh, due to component aging? Well, component aging isn't really much of a problem these days with digital. Um, I typically, I don't know, every couple of years maybe. Uh, with, with projectors, it's more important because you have a lamp that ages. And so that becomes important to, to recalibrate that every year or so. And then you're going to replace that lamp every couple of years. And when you do, you want to put about 100 hours on it and then calibrate that uh, because it's going to be m m much different from what it used to be. All right. You want to stick around for the top of the hour or do you want to get back happy to Santa to. Cruz? No, no, no. I'm happy to stick around. All right. Thanks, Scott. You bet. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Tim is in Ontario, California. Our next call. Hi, Tim. Hey, Leo. Welcome. Hey, I've got a question about we're, we're a small company, and uh, we we have our own domain, and they're hosting, uh, Bluehost is hosting our, our email, and so everyone's downloading their email to their own um, Outlook. What I'm looking to do is to be able to share files and share calendars. Yeah. And... Uh, and so I've been kind of looking at solutions for that. I looked into Gmail. I don't really want to set up an Exchange server. I'm just yeah. You definitely don't want to set up an Exchange server. So yeah. uh, this is, of course, a very competitive space right now. Microsoft has dominated it with Exchange servers for email and SharePoint server, which will allow you to collaborate on documents, share documents. Um, and if you're a big enterprise, you might in fact have some iron in the basement running those but most of the time you'd 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 buy it from somebody who does a managed exchange or managed sharepoint service you can even buy it from microsoft now the i think the as azure services now are sold directly by microsoft as well so look around you'll see a lot of people who offer uh, managed sharepoint hosting for instance and it's usually fairly inexpensive google would love to take the crown from microsoft on this so 
they also, as you noted, offer a solution that involves Gmail and then Google Apps. Um, and you can share files uh, using Google Drive. It has a drive uh, storage as well. Uh, that's what we use. Uh, but that's also because our office is filled with geeks who are most comfortable with Gmail. They all, almost all, in fact, I think all had Gmail accounts before they came here. Uh, if if you're really a Microsoft shop and you everybody's using Outlook and loves Outlook, you probably would want to go with Hosted Exchange or Hosted SharePoint. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have a sponsor, uh, Vertacore, that does that. But that's just uh, that's one of many companies. It's a very uh, popular way to do this. You could, I suppose, even get um, Office 365 subscriptions. I think you'd want. Depends on um, what you mean when you say share files. If you'd like people to collaborate together on a document that would be more well, SharePoint if you mean I just want to have a file that they can download that could be done very easily with Google Apps well we have a file and print server so that we can use that oh. when I said sharing files it was it's more of, of a, a calendar and um, actually just calendar at this point oh, well, that's just, not we yeah have, everyone has their own calendar and we're stepping on each other's dates and yeah, it's, yeah it's a, share, a shared calendar would be a great way to do that Right. Um, yeah, um, certainly a hosted exchange would do it, but let me ask the chat room if they have a better way to do it. We, again, uh, we have been lucky enough to use, uh, be able to use Google Calendar for that. Um, if you do use Office 365, there are shared public calendars within that. Um, it just depends on how fancy you want to get. You know, we have a small shop, 20 people, um, and we, we do a little calendar sharing. We certainly... When you say sharing, do you want your admin to be able to see your calendar so she can schedule, he can schedule appointments for you? Or do you want, are you talking about uh, big projects and you need to share large calendars and things like that? Both. 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 So we've got a couple of large projects coming through. Yeah, and if it's then, project uh, oriented, yeah, you want to do it right. Yeah. Right. And certainly what we do uh, would not be work for that at all. Uh, so, yeah, I would say... Um, uh, you can start with looking at what Office 365 offers with a shared public calendar. If that's not sufficient, then hosted exchange. And that I would never, ever tell somebody, even a big company, to run their own exchange server. It's no fun at all. But the good news is hosted exchange is not expensive. It's comparable to Google where, you know, you pay 10 bucks a month per seat or whatever. And everybody has access to that, not just at work, but at home and so forth. And it's a, it's a good way to do that. Right. So there's a Very range real. of choices. This is something... Of course, it's very common in business. Uh, and, and yes, as somebody, as P.S. Chops in the chat room says, sharing is a big umbrella. <laughs> it could cover a, lot, a wide range of things. Um, I would say at the top end, that's hosted Exchange or even more hosted SharePoint. At the low end, it's uh, Google. Somewhere in the middle is Office 365 and, uh, and a managed Exchange server. Those are kind of, that's kind of the range. Dennis... In Costa Rica. Hi, Dennis. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, yes. Hi, Leo. I've uh, been using Pro XPN since they were a sponsor of yours, and I Thank signed you. up for that uh, uh, special where, you know, I got a, got it locked in for $60 a year. And that's I a it. good deal. I mean, that, yeah, that's uh, really a good deal. So what that is, we should explain, is a VPN. If you are in uh -huh. an if you are uh, in an open access spot and you're worried about people snooping on what you're doing, which they can, if you're at a coffee shop, at a hotel, you're using uh, shared internet. But also, if you're worried about your ISP, and I don't know what, what it's like in Costa Rica, but maybe you want some privacy in you doing business, having a VPN, a virtual private network, will encrypt all your data. You can actually look like you're in the United States with one of those because you go through their server and you emerge in the United States. It looks like you're in the U.S., not in Costa Rica. There may be reasons why you'd want to do that. Um, the only downside to a VPN is it tends to slow things down a little bit. All right. Well, well what I'm wanting to know is I also use Talkatone to make my... Uh... Me too. Love it. And I'm wanting to know if I'm using my VPN... And I'm using Talkatone. Will that uh, will that uh, encrypt the voice data? No. So understand how a VPN is a tunnel, and eventually, before at some point, you have to go out on the public unencrypted internet. Other, it, it won't work. It's not a tunnel all the way to where you're going. It's only a tunnel to the Open VPN server. So if you're using uh, Pro XPN server in Seattle, you've got a tunnel between San Jose, Costa Rica, and Seattle. 
every bit of traffic that goes through that tunnel is safe, but it, eventually it has to emerge. It emerges in Seattle onto the public Internet. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to talk to websites. They'd go, what is this encrypted stuff I'm getting? And the same thing with Talkatone. Talkatone's encrypted right up to the point where you emerge, but at some point you have to emerge in the uh, outside world. Now, I don't know about Talkatone. Skype is encrypted end-to-end. -end. What you're looking for is an encrypted VoIP service that is what we call end-to-end. -end. That means from mm -hmm. the beginning to the end, it's encrypted. A, a VPN is not end-to-end. -end. Skype is. There are other solutions. Um, there's something called Red Phone you might want to look at from Whisper Systems. That is a that is software you put on your phone. I believe it's VoIP, but it is encrypted from your phone to the next person's phone. Uh, it's like one of those scramblers you might have seen in the old Cold War uh, movies. Uh, nobody can hear what's going on. You have to be on either end. This is, to me, the solution to privacy on the Internet is end-to-end -end encryption. But it requires that both parties, sending and receiving, are using the same technology. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And now, Scott Wilkinson, the Santa guy. Oh, oh, oh. When you wear red like that, you just, you're <laughs> I know, just I know. asking for it. <laughs> I know. I know, I know. Hey, Leo, I meant to, I meant to mention to you um, another uh, high-res recording that I would like to recommend to Good. you and all the listeners. Good. I've got to, uh, I it's... wrote down the AIX because I want to start getting some stuff there. Good, good. Now, uh, Mark Waldrop, the head of AIX, also runs a second high-res download site called iTrax, I-T-R-A-X dot com, okay. on which he puts other – on a AIX records, it's only his stuff. iTrax has stuff from other people that he vets and makes sure – you know, has the standards that he upholds and, and then makes them available. And there's one – uh, album on there that I really want to recommend, especially this time of year. It's called Tis the Season Tuba Jolly. <laughs> Let me guess. And, Are you involved in that in any way? Uh, uh, <laughs> peripherally. <laughs> peripherally. I didn't actually play on the album. Uh, I did take some of the photos that are in the liner notes of the CD, but it was also just released in high resolution. Uh, high resolution two channel, 2496 two channel, and 2496 5.1. Um, and it was engineered by a very famous engineer whose name is Sean Murphy, who is John Williams' first call engineer. Wow. <laughs> it was recorded in 2496. Mm -hmm. And and I've I've had it asked to me, well, why would you need to record tubas in 2496? Because they don't go that high. Well, You've got cymbals and bells. You just heard jingle bells right there. Um, I and, have and just so read a book, a which you must read, David Byrne of the Talking Heads. Yes, I'm, I'm writing that down I've right been meaning now. to send an email out to some of my friends. I want, Steve, if you're listening, I, you, this, I, this is in a, it's called How Music Works. It's a little bit of a memoir about the Talking Heads, but it's mostly a history of music. And one of the things he talks about is... Recording, analog recordings, a deep tone makes a deep cut in the record, mm. right? And right. so uh, going back to the Edison cylinders, they would get the louder, deeper stuff farther away from the recording trumpet. Yes. Everybody uh, had to play into it. At, right. Into the singers are in front because they're mid-range and quieter. But a tuba, you would have to stand across the room and a drum right. kit would have to be <laughs> down the block. Right. Because they couldn't record them. That's and right. then even with uh, vinyl LPs, um, you'll if you have a lot of bass, it will uh, mean fewer minutes on the vinyl. It actually oh, makes think. wider tracks. Wow, I didn't realize that. So what he's talking about in this book, which you will find fascinating, is how the space, like CBGB's versus a, a concert hall, yeah. and the technologies have influenced composers and music, and it's unbelievable. It is, wow. I feel like I didn't know music until I read this book. Wow. Now, wow. you're a musician, and, uh, you know, Steve's a musician, so they'll know, you guys will know a lot of this probably, but maybe not. Because a lot of this, you know, we just are unconsciously doing what we do and may not have known the antecedents 
you know, he talks about Lucent and about Bell and Bell Labs trying to figure out what's the least amount of bandwidth you could use and still have an intelligible voice. They, they right. invented sampling. He talks about the history yep. of sampling. It's fascinating. Wow. I'm wow. listening. That's He's talking about going on my Christmas list. Oh, how music works. I'm listening to it on Audible. Unfortunately, David oh, Byrne is not. Even better. Yeah. He's not reading it, but he does do the intro. Um, but uh, I, it's just, um, uh, I think, an incredible book for anybody like us who likes to think a little bit about why music is the way the it music is. We're listening yeah. To, yeah. He, it, for Brado, okay, I think uh, your wife would be very interested in this. Yeah. Vibrato, both in, in operatic music, started in operatic music, uh, in right. singing, but also in violins and other things, was a response to recordings not being able to maintain pitch. And so they and so they would vary it. And once people got used to the vibrato, they'd listen to the older way of playing a violin without vibrato or singing without vibrato and think it sounded bad. <laughs> but in fact, vibrato was, according to Byrne, a compensation for pitchiness. It was meant to cover up for a problem. Yes. Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. Well, you see? A lot of singers do use it to cover up their, their Well, every own, everybody. But if you if you were a singer and you didn't use vibrato nowadays, people would think you couldn't sing. Yeah. And if you're a violinist and you didn't you, but it started with fretless instruments like violins where it was hard to hit the pitch. Right, right. Trombones too. Yeah. But you don't use vibrato on a trombone, do you? Sure you do. You can <laughs> in jazz particularly. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Anyway, I I just find this fascinating. Wow. Well, that's definitely on my Christmas list. Though, yeah, sure. highly recommended. I think Susanna would like it too because I think there's voice stuff. There's a Joanna. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Joanna would like Joanna, this too. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because there's voice stuff. I mean, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. He is wow brilliant. He's an amazing guy. He thinks a lot. You know, he's talking about CBGBs and how that in environment influenced the sound that they made. Oh, it's just it's great. The Talking Heads made. Yeah. yeah. It's it's more modern music than it would be uh, classical, sure. But well, certainly, recording te technologies have influenced classical music as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Big time, big time. Hey, you mentioned Squarespace. I just want to let everybody know that my I have a website on Squarespace. It's called TubaChristmasLA.com. <laughs> Go check it out. Tis the season, Tuba Jolly. Tuba Jolly. That's right. And those of you in L.A., Tuba Christmas uh, L.A. is December 7th, Sunday. Go to TubaChristmasLA.com for all the details. I'm the conductor. I just want to say there's a lot of euphoniums in this Tuba Jolly. Yes, there are. There are six. <laughs> <laughs> there are a total of 12 tubas on that album, six euphoniums and six tubas. And si euphoniums are merely tenor tubas. A tenor tuba. That's all it is. It's yeah. just a smaller tuba. I like saying tenor tuba. <laughs> And believe me, tuba players get into long, extended arguments about the difference between a euphonium and a tenor tuba and a baritone. And, you know, there are minor differences, it's true, and what those differences are are open to great debate, and people just continue to talk about it forever. Uh, but it's basically, you know, a tuba in the trombone range of pitches. That's not a tuba, that's a trombone! <laughs> but man, these arrangements are so good, uh, and the it did playing sound good, is I gotta say. so good. Yeah, it sounded really good. These are like the best players in the world. The tuba player for the LA Philharmonic is on this record. Awesome. You know, so it's like that kind of stuff. Ken Crayley in the chat room is saying high res music is awesome. I'm and, excited uh, about it. I, you know what? I may be uh, deluding myself. I can't say that I'm not. But boy, I, I think it sounds good. I don't know, man. I, you, I you never know these... did your test. I was too. Oh, you I was afraid to do your test because <laughs> I, I don't want to know happened. that I can't tell the difference. But I do well, use your results when I'm talking about this because I yeah. think that that's very telling. Exactly. Exactly. Well, now that you have the Pono player, you should. Uh, yeah. Download I had high. Files. Turns out, you know, I was looking into it. The the the, the DACs in my Anki are quite good. Yeah. They're these uh, TI makes these Burn Brown. Uh, they acquire Burr Brown, Burr Dax, Burr Brown yeah. and they're very good DAX. So actually, I'm getting, when I put that USB key with a high res into my Ankyo and listen with the headphones, or even, I have, these Aperians sound really good. Really I am, I love how it is. Hey, we're out of time. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. See, See you later. Week. Bye. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, and, of course, smartphones. 8888-ASK-LEO. If you have a question, you'd like to talk high-tech, I'd love to talk about it with you. I guess we're going to have to add wearables to that list. This is going to be, 2015 is going to be the year 
of the smartwatch. I mean, it is somewhat this year. I wear a smartwatch all the time. Um, but we're all waiting for Apple and the Apple Watch. We learned a lot about the Apple Watch this week. Apple finally released what they call the SDK, the Software Development Kit. This is These are the tools that software developers need to make applications that take advantage of the smartwatch, the Apple Watch. And we learned a lot more about what the Apple Watch will be capable of. And, it, you know, I'm getting a little excited. I'm kind of thinking this is good. This, I'm, I was initially skeptical. But I'm starting to be a believer that maybe wearables, there are some... We're wearing our, our smartphone in a way. I mean, I carry it in my pocket. If you have it in a purse or a pocket, you're kind of wearing your smartphone. But the idea that you could just peek at your wrist or maybe look at your glasses or somehow just quickly grasp what's going on. When my phone rings, my watch buzzes, vibrates, and I can see who's calling and decide whether to answer it or not. When I get a text, it buzzes. I can respond through the watch, things like that. You start to get used to it. So uh, I'll add wearables to the list of things we talk about. 8888-ASK-LEO is the number. 888-827-5536 from anywhere in the world, including Costa Rica. And uh, But it's toll-free from the U.S. and Canada. You'll have to call via Skype if you're going to do it from Costa Rica. Eight, but the number works. 8888-ASK-LEO. Joe's next in East Vale, California. Hi, Joe. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Hey, Leo. Good to talk to you, Leo. Nice to talk to you. Hey, I have a question. I'm like you, you know, I, I, I like the technology. So I had like the, the wearable. So I got the pebble and then uh, I got the both pebbles, the plastic and the steel and compared it to the Moto 360. I mean, like just visually it looks awesome and it's a, it's a touch screen. So my question is, um, can I, I can't wait for the Apple phone. I mean, the Apple watch to come out, but for the time being, I'm thinking of getting the 360, but I don't want to get the data plan on a phone because um, I don't want to pay the extra money. I did that once when I had the iOS, my iPhone, and the Windows phone, and it, it was just not a good idea to have two phones. Well, for, for well, me. here's the deal. First of all, uh, I can maybe solve this conundrum. The Apple Watch will only work with an iPhone. Right. And in fact, I'm kind of thinking, oh. Darn! I'm gonna have to start carrying around an iPhone, which I don't right now. Uh, I have one, but I don't. I prefer the Android devices. The Moto 360 only works with Android, right? So uh, that's going to be determined by what phone uh, you carry around. The only one that works with Windows Phone is the new Microsoft Band. Well, Leo, what about the um, what about the? I was going to get a tablet. Well, I actually I ordered a tablet. It's like an entry Android tablet. Can I can I sync it with that? That's an interesting question. I don't think so. All of these devices uh, need a phone because they need a data connection. Right. Um, I, I think they all uh, require a phone as far as I know. I don't know of any that don't that will work just with a tablet. So uh, okay. even even with a Wi-Fi enabled tablet. Um, right. Uh, yeah, I think, <laughs> I hate to tell you, <laughs> you're, mm, if fun. you want a smart, but the whole point of a smart watch really is none of these, including the Pebble, really designed to be standalone. Samsung does make one watch that has uh, a, f a little 3G chip in it and a radio, but it's big, but as a result, it has to be. All of these watches, uh, in order to be watch roughly watch size, and most of them are pretty big for a watch even, but roughly watch size, have to offload a lot of the function to uh, a smartphone. Um, not merely, I mean, well, for instance, Apple is saying, uh, we've just, one of the things we learned this week is that there will be no, Apple Watch apps that work only on the watch. That in every case, it's it, you'll have to have a phone app, which then communicates with the watch. In every single case, now there are you could not you could run with the watch without a phone, but you'd lose most much of the functionality. I think you can still listen to music and a few you know it measures your steps, and a, a lot of watches will do you know kind of rudimentary functions like pedometer functions without the phone. Uh, but really, they're designed to work with the phone almost as an extension of the phone, as a notification device. You had a Pebble, you know, primarily what the Pebble does is let you know who's calling when they're calling, let you read texts. Pebble won't let you respond to texts on the Pebble, but the some of these watches, the Moto 360 will. I could talk to the Moto 360. But in every case, it's because it's, it's sending that data back to the phone. There's just not enough uh, smarts in these watches. They're too small to do any work. They're really, they're really just an extension, a second screen 
for a phone. And I don't think you'd be able to do this uh, on a tablet. You know what I'll do is I'm sitting and looking at my Nexus 7 tablet, which is probably one of the best uh, Google devices, uh, tablets out there. And uh, I'll, I don't think I can download, for instance, the Connect app that's required to work with a, um, a Moto 360. Let me just let's just see if it's allowed. I'm typing in Connect. And usually what will happen when you go to the... Uh, the App Store. There's Motorola Connect. Let's see. Install. Well, it's letting me install. It doesn't say it's incompatible. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. Maybe you can. You won't get all the functionality, but uh, maybe you can on a Wi-Fi device. Certainly, be enough probably to play with the watch. That's. Uh, you know what? You might have come up with something there, Joe. I'll. 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 I'll continue to set this up and see if it works. Deb. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This. Does this have Bluetooth? Yeah, it does. Good. All right. It's got to have Bluetooth. That's how they connect with a watch. Debbie in Anaheim, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Debbie. Oh, good afternoon, Leo. Thanks good afternoon. For Thanks for calling. Hey, my husband passed away last year, so I had to go out and buy a new computer. He, I'm sorry. Uh, he's my tech guy. Uh, and a new computer, so it's about a year old. And it is running slower than my old computer that I wanted to throw against the wall. <laughs> oh, that's not good. And, you know, pop-ups everywhere. I mean, they're, it should be called popcorn, not pop-ups, because they're just popping like a, a hot pan. Ah. Well, and it's running slow. I've been on the, you know, on the line waiting for you, and it took me that long to get it started. Yeah, you got something on there. You got a, you got a infection. Yeah, so what do I do with it? The because sample of the infection is the pop-ups. Okay. Um, and so it's not, so let me talk about, cause I, I, I could tell you how to fix it, but also how not to get it again. Uh, these things come from downloading and installing software. Sometimes they'll, um, they'll add search engine, you know, things that, that pop up different pages and give you ads. Uh, sometimes they'll come cause of malware in almost every case. There's two ways you can get infected. One with your permission, you'll run a program. You may may think you're running a, a safe program, but you're not. You know, a lot of times they trick you into running a program. Or two, without your knowledge, because you haven't kept the system up to date and bad guys are taking advantage of a vulnerability in the system. Um, so you do you run Windows Update on a regular basis? Oh, no, I have no idea what that is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't. I don't know computers that well. I, I guess I know too much to get to push the button. <laughs> yeah, I would have. I would have got. I would have encouraged you to get a Mac, or perhaps a Chromebook, some other device than Windows. Windows. I think people buy Windows uh, because it's what everybody buys for years. Is what everybody has bought, but it's really overly complex. It does more than most people need. And it requires uh, some sophistication on your part to operate. In fact, I really believe that in order to use Windows safely, you need to kind of be a security expert or at least know, know some base, some really, you know, some serious security techniques. Okay. So well, I really, I think that uh, it, now it's too late. You've already got a Windows machine. I'm not going to make you buy a new one by any means. But uh, we need to fix this. And uh, if you hang on the line, we'll do it when we come back. We have to take a break. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Cos is what sounds like careful to you. Cos says, "Oh, you only need to be careful to be safe on Windows." Yeah, <laughs> if you know what careful is. But you need, but you 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 think it's easy because you know all that stuff. You know about Windows updates. You know about <laughs> updating Flash. You know about updating your PDF reader on a regular basis and keeping it up to date. You know not to click links on Facebook when your friends say, "Oh, you won't believe what happened last night." You know enough to look at the URL bar to make sure that you're on the site you think you're on. Careful for you is easy because you know all these things. But you have to know all those things first, and I think that that's asking a lot of people. 
I think there's and and on the con converse side, is there an argument for buying Windows if you're a gamer maybe, or you have to use bit line of business software that requires Windows, but for somebody who's surfing the internet and reading email, you shouldn't. Windows is way more than you need or want and requires all of this knowledge. So I stand by my comments. For most people, buying Windows is a bad idea. If there were a compelling reason to get it, fine. If you're a gamer, get Windows and learn how to protect yourself. And it's absolutely doable. I'm, I use Windows all the time. I don't, I don't get bit, but I know what I'm doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, and it's tough because, uh, of course, Debbie had her husband, her late husband, to, to maintain it all for her. And he obviously did know that. Um, and, and so she quite reasonably thought, well, Windows would be, you know, it's what I've used all along. I know how to use it. I'm just going to keep using it. But absent some IT expert keeping an eye on things, it's just a recipe for disaster. A home, I would argue a home theater PC, David Bix, is a highly advanced use of a computer. Most people just get a Roku. <laughs> I, I think most people should not buy Windows. I don't understand why you'd want to get on that train. Absent a compelling reason, like I have to use Windows software, I would say there's absolutely no reason to get Windows. That's just nutty. Yeah, it's a shame here that the Microsoft discontinued steady state. Sure, people use it. I have a TiVo. It's called a TiVo. Almost all the cable companies offer DVRs. You don't need the Windows Media Center. In fact, it's a, I think a home theater PC with Windows is a terrible idea. That's a hobbyist. That's not a normal thing to do. I don't even do a home theater PC. <laughs> the Romeo is awesome, Mike. In fact, I think I got it because of you. I know you have been a TiVo, a TiVo Romeo fan for a long time. Yeah, I think a lot of people should get an iPad. A Chromebook would be a very good choice for most people. Note the date ears on that blog post. But thank you for posting that. <laughs> oh, I see they still have it in 2011. I put a cable card in my TV, but it works just fine. My cable box doesn't even need a cable card. You're going to have a hard time convincing me a home theater PC is a normal thing to do. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Debbie is in Anaheim uh, and is suffering from an infected Windows PC. Uh, and you have my deepest sympathy, when, uh, Debbie. I, it, that's just a, an awful thing to have happen. Uh, oh, I, lost, I lost my tech guy. My yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. My computer is uh, so sorry. It's beautiful. I, yeah. I think, what do, you do, what do you do with your computer, Debbie? Uh, I'm in real estate. Okay, so do you use MLS software? Or? Use the MLS. I use. Uh, I was trying. I was trying to work with some REOs, and I was. Um, and, and I this is when I really noticed the problem um, was when I was required to download Firefox and um, as a, a search engine, and all of a sudden I had everything popping. Um, yeah, oh, I'm it, sorry. Because it was for business, I was downloading it. Okay, I feel it's a nice case. If you have software that requires Windows, and it sounds like you do, then I can understand why you'd be running Windows. It's just part of your business. You need to. Yeah. If you're just surfing the web and doing email, which is 99% of what almost everybody does... Uh, then you don't need Windows. But if you need Windows, then unfortunately, the next step is you need to ha uh, learn how to protect yourself. 
yeah. uh, in a Windows environment. And it's I don't it's not Microsoft's fault exactly. They've done a lot to protect you with right. Windows, but as time has gone by. Uh, because Windows is so dominant, bad guys have learned and have managed to exploit Windows. You know, just last Tuesday, Microsoft put out an update for their web server that affects every version of Windows back to Windows 95. And it makes their, it, it's an exploit that anybody, who, any bad guy who wants to attack and take over a, a Windows web server can infect that server and then, then using that infect every machine that visits the server. And it, uh, in order for this to be fixed, the person who runs the server has to know about this, has to download that update last Tuesday. By the way, that first update was broken. So Microsoft had to issue another patch on Thursday. They had to know to do that and then update their server, and that required a server reboot. In other words, this is for people who are running the servers, but it can affect anybody who visits that website who's running Windows and it has not patched. So this and this happened last week. OK. Yeah. <laughs> and so this has been happening ever since you got that computer. Almost every week there's a new one. OK. So what do I do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is good. All right. What do I do then? Well, at this point, it's hard to tell you what's wrong with your system. And one of the problems with uh, infections on your system, they can be minor and easily removed but they can also and the problem is once there's an infection on there what you don't know is how much is on there whether it's just that or whether the bad guy put that on and then in the background put something else on and most bad guys don't want you to know that they've got stuff on your system so right. it may not have a symptom at all the symptoms uh, are just an indicator something's wrong. And the biggest symptom, by the way, is a major slowdown. Now, as computers get old, they slow down, but a year-old computer should not be slower than your old XP machine. No. It, it should be swift, like lightning. Yeah. So the fix is depends on you and how ambitious you are. What I tell people, the kind of rule of thumb, I tell people if once you get infected, the best thing to do is also the biggest pain in the butt, which is to back up your data Format your drive and reinstall Windows. Start over. Did Dell ship you some restore disks when you got that computer? I do not remember getting any backup disks. If you don't get disks, then when you first turn on the computer, it will say, let's make a system restore, a system recovery set. And then you'll have six CDs or whatever, and you'll have to put them in one by one and make it. And you didn't do that either, did you? Okay, no. <laughs> yeah. Open your and play. Yeah. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can find a trusted uh, expert to do this. Okay. Good, good luck, because there's a lot of guys who think they know but don't. Or you can call Dell and get those discs for a okay. really a nominal fee. Uh, they'll I, like twelve bucks or twenty bucks. They'll send you a set of discs. Everyone okay. who has a computer should have a way of restoring that computer. Is it a Windows 8 computer? Yeah. Ah, then you are. Oh, oh, then you don't have to worry. I take it all back. I should have asked you that up front. I don't know okay. why I assumed it was Windows 7. Windows 8 has a built in uh, emergency, emergency break glass mode okay. that, that you can restore the computer because it has a hidden partition on it. Okay. So you can even go through step by step um, the first just kind of fixing it and see if that helps. And if repairing it doesn't help, then you can go and wipe the drive. But do back up all your stuff first, okay? Carbonite? No, carbonite will be too slow because you don't want to wait while it back does that first backup, which might take a week. What you'd probably want to do is have an ex do you have an external hard drive of any kind? Uh, no, I do not. It's just it's one of those beautiful computers. There's no external nothing. Oh, those one of those one all in ones are beautiful, aren't they? No. Uh, the Dell XPS 1. you got a nice computer. I love that computer. It's a beautiful computer. <laughs> yeah. So, so you can, there's a recovery partition, and you can, if you go into your settings on your, um, on your Windows 8 machine, you can uh, go through a process that will rebuild the machine, and that'll probably fix it. Okay. So but do, but that. do make a backup. You haven't been backing up either, have you? Uh, that's what, Carbonite was so, wasn't it? Do you have Carbonite? I do. Oh, bless you. I have it all. Uh, oh, you're all good then. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to install Carbonite now. No, yeah, if you've been running it all along, you're good. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness you listen to this show and you and you partake of our sponsors. 
Bless you. <laughs> so now it's pretty easy. Now it's just a question of re reinstalling Windows. Then you'll install Carbonite and you'll do a restore and all your data will come back. Okay. So I go into my settings and just rebuild it? Or yeah, Let me, yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll put in the show notes, because this is a little more complicated than I want to walk you through yes. on the air, but we'll put it at techguylabs.com. Uh, okay. Microsoft has a, you know, a rebuilding Windows 8 uh, page, and we'll walk you through that. Should, that that should it. fix, that should speed it up. What you want, what, what it will do is get you back to the speed it was when it came. It was fast when it came, right? It was beautiful. Yeah. It was beautiful. It was it was solution down the mountains and mammoths. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I will put you. I will send you this uh, page. It's uh, at uh, windows.microsoft.com, or you could Google how to refat, refresh, reset, or restore your PC. Yeah, if I can get the PC to work, yeah. Yeah, if you can't get it to work, bring it to you know somebody you trust. They will do this. It's not. It shouldn't cost too much because you don't need any special tools. Um, I bet you didn't get Windows 8.1 either, did you? Uh, that I don't know. Yeah, that's okay. another update. You got to have those updates. Really, really important. You might. You might want to enlist somebody who uh, get a get a new support guy. Thank you for calling. My uh, condolences, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'll give you the link for the chat room for uh, James. Our show today brought to you by my buddies at FreshBooks. And I say buddies. I think I can, I think that's fair for me to call them my buddies. I uh, started using FreshBooks 10 years ago in 2004. Remember, I was going to Canada to do the, the call for help show there. And I had to invoice Rogers uh, every month. And I would always forget, you know, because I was using Microsoft Word to do my invoices. I'd always forget. And after, I remember the worst was, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, the time I'd forgotten to invoice them for something like eight months. Was it Rogers or so? It was somebody. And uh, I finally invoiced them. And they said, we, <laughs> we're not going to pay you eight months? What are you, nuts? <laughs> That's when Amber MacArthur told me about FreshBooks, and they saved my life. They've gotten better and better and better, by the way, in the intervening time. Um, this is a time to do it. Get a fresh start for 2015 with FreshBooks. It's the best way to invoice clients, to organize expenses, to track your time. They now have mobile apps, which makes it even easier to do this all on your Android or iOS device. Uh, the first thing I did immediately started invoicing online, and it's so fast. They handle multiple currencies, which was a boon for me because I was billing in Canadian dollars. You'll get real-time business reports in just two clicks of the mouse. That makes your accountant very happy come tax time. You can even snap photos of receipts on your phone and file them away in FreshBooks. FreshBooks is amazing. I love FreshBooks. And the thing about it is you get paid faster because, well, first of all, you're going to invoice on time. <laughs> That's one reason. But also it makes it very easy for your clients to pay. They prefer it. They've done research. With FreshBooks, you get paid an average of five days faster. That means a lot to a freelancer. FreshBooks customers, on average, double their revenue in the first 24 months of using it. That is fantastic. It grows with your business. You can add clients and projects and staff easily. No more awkward emails or phone calls to late-paying clients. It's done automatically in FreshBooks. They'll even integrate with your existing apps like MailChimp or PayPal or Google Apps. And what a great customer support team. Number one support team in the world. FreshBooks support rock stars. Help is free forever and guaranteed to talk to a real-life human every time. John Sui, a photographer, says, quote, FreshBooks is easy to work with and easy to learn. I'll agree with him on that. It was so easy. When I started, I loved it. I could jump right in. I want you to try it free. 30 days, no obligation. Go to freshbooks.com slash techguy. And if you see a how did you hear about us field, if you do me a favor, just write the tech guy in there so they know. So uh, then they go, oh, that tech guy, he's nice. Freshbooks.com slash tech guy. And I'm telling you, if you are doing your own invoicing, you got to get Freshbooks. If you're doing your own accounting, you got to get Freshbooks. Freshbooks.com slash tech guy. Johnny Jed is here. With his lovely mustache for Movember, <laughs> you look like Snidely Whiplash. 
I don't know who that is. You must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. <laughs> no, it's the other way around. You must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. You must pay the rent. I can't pay the rent. I'll pay the rent. Curses foiled again. No? Not, <laughs> does it ring a bell at all? No, but it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Twirl them for me a little bit. Can you? Is it long enough no, now? No, it's not, it's not there yet. Johnny growing his uh, facial hair for Movember. This is something started in Australia and has really taken the world by storm. Men grow beards or mustaches uh, kind of to raise awareness for men's health issues and raise a little money on the side, too. And you look good with a mustache. But I, <laughs> I hear your wife says you're going to spoil Thanksgiving with it. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> what is? How could that spoil Thanksgiving? I think she thinks the pumpkin pie is going to get stuck in my mustache. <laughs> Johnny is uh, here every week to talk about travel and using technology to travel better. He's the king of travel. His website, uh, you'll find it at johnnyjet.com, has a free newsletter you can subscribe to and all sorts of ways to travel better. What do you got for us this week? So what made news this week is JetBlue broke a lot of people's hearts when they announced that they're going to start charging for the first bag, which they used to give away for free, and that they're going to add i think 15 more seats nice. so their 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 leg room is going to go from 34.7 inches which was the widest pitch in all of uh the u.s industry to 33.1 and comparing comparing that as virgin right now is this will be the second with 32.6 virgin pitch. is virgin america is is the smallest leg room no, no, no. Second, second largest. JetBlue oh. had the JetBlue had the largest leg. Oh, I see. They're going okay. And and now they're they're decreasing. They're still going to have the largest, they say, but it's only going to buy a bit, by a little bit. Then it's Virgin, Alaska, WestJet, American. Who's the worst? So, Who has the worst leg room? Oh, Spirit. Spirit, without a doubt, is twenty eight point three inches. <laughs> that means and your knees would be up around your chin. <laughs> true, but the good thing is that Spirit, the seats do not recline. Oh, that's good news. Well, at least at, at least inches, you have all 28 right. inches to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, JetBlue is doing this, you know, to make the money. baggage fee makes me crazy. That should be the price of the ticket. It just really makes me nuts. I know it doesn't bother you because you never pack a bag. The only, well, you have to start flying Southwest. They're the only ones who are offering free bags. And it's actually two. They're the last so, ones. They're the last they're, ones. They're, they're holding out. They, they said they have no plans to do it, and they're really capitalizing now. Good. Now that JetBlue announced that they're going to start charging next year. Well, how much? 25 bucks a bag? 50 bucks? It's usually, it's usually 25 for the first bag and then 35 for the second. I'm not entirely sure, to be I, honest. I, I guess it makes sense because there are people who don't who carry bring carry-on only. But all what happens to it, in my experience, you get on a plane and everybody's got basically the same amount of luggage, but they carry it on the plane and try to jam it in. And the, and the plane's crazy and you got chickens running up and down the <laughs> aisles. And it seems like a bad idea. All right. You know, Thanks, uh, JetBlue. All right. So I got a travel website of the week for okay. you. I just, I just tweeted you. It's called Fly or Drive Calculator, and it's by BeFrugal.com. Oh, well, this they is come a good with, idea. They come up with a little widget, so I, you can add it to any website. So I just added it to a page of mine. So you can put in your city where you're going and where you're heading, and you can decide if you want to you know, drive or fly to Grandma's house for Thanksgiving or Christmas and see what the cost will be. So it's, it's really cool. You put in your locations, you put in your dates, how many people, one way round trip. Then you can put in uh, what kind of vehicle, vehicle you're driving, the year, the make, how many hours you plan on driving daily, uh, how much you plan on spending for a hotel at night, and the amount of tolls it will cost you. That's great. Or what you think it will cost you. And then also what airport actually will already be preloaded. It'll tell you what airports are closest to you. And then it shows you how much time you usually need to get in advance to show up to the airport. Anyway, it's pretty cool. It gives you the estimated prices of everything and this the is time. Really awesome. I am. I love this idea because there are places it would be less expensive to uh, to drive to. Sure. And maybe faster even. Without wow. a doubt. Yeah. Especially especially if you're going from let's say New York to Washington D.C. Yeah. You know, people drive. And people fly. You have to show up to the airport an hour and a half in advance. There's usually delays. You got to go through security. By the time you get there, then the airport, if you're flying into, uh, if you're flying into DCA, or actually IAD, Dulles, you have to you know, drive into the city. So by the time you drive, it will be much quicker and most likely cheaper. You can even specify how many hours a day you're going to drive. You know. Yeah. I, I don't know. What do you do? You, have you ever done a long trip like this? 
I'm not a big, I don't like to drive a lot, but I think the longest I've ever done, it was 10 hours. I went from, I went from Look at this. Norwalk. I could fly to LA, take me seven hours and 20 minutes, a cost of 2,500 bucks, impact my carbon uh, dioxide impact, 7,000 pounds, or drive door to door each way, six hours, three minutes. It's an hour and 17 minutes less, cost $133, including hotel and gas, and my CO2 impact is one tenth. Well, what did you put in for the dates to fly for tomorrow or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. It okay, was expensive trip. Minute, how many? And how <laughs> many I, people? Three people. But many? I guarantee you, three people can't fly for 133 bucks. So I think no, that is still doubt. cheaper to drive. Without a doubt. Wow. So, I'm going. To, hint. I'm driving to L.A. <laughs> you know, the thing that's most interesting is is the door to door time, because you know you have to drive to the airport. You sit in the airport for a while. Blah blah blah. And when you add that in, it's really faster to drive than to fly because you just get in the car and go. That's great. That's on Johnny Jet's uh, website, johnnyjet.com, the flyer or, drive calculator. Or take a bus or or the train. I mean, especially if you're on the East Coast, take the train, especially yeah. between D.C., New York, or Boston, Philadelphia. I, I prefer taking the train. They even calculate baggage fees. They they know you're going to be paying you know, baggage fees. You know, that they're is awesome. All right, so what's your app? I got an app called Sit or Squat. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. You're going to love this one. It's, uh -huh. it's by Charmin. Charmin. Um, the toilet paper company? Yes. So when you're traveling, one of the big things is, you know, people have a hard time finding a good, clean place to go. So now with this app, you can actually rate a public bathroom and let people know oh, where they are. that's hysterical. Especially, especially when you're in Europe. You know, you can't find a free place to go to the bathroom. You have to, you know, you either have to go to a cafe, buy a cup of coffee, or try and find a McDonald's. But this is a good place to rate. I, I iPhone and Android. This is awesome. Especially for for women. I mean, I feel bad for women who have to use the loo. Because some of these bathrooms I go into are really disgusting. Facebook login for the website, but the apps you don't have to. And uh, you can get them free on iPhone and Android. And the Nokia Theater Kids, very good place to go. <laughs> Clean and uh, free. That's I, I, right. Yeah. The, you know, it's true. As you wander through a city, a big city, sometimes uh, it's hard to find a, a comfort station, as we might say. Without, without a doubt. Now we have an app. There's an app even for that. There's an I, app. And you're walking around Europe and you're like, I, I just want to use a little. I know. Feel. I know. It's just not. I know. So, Johnny Jet is at johnnyjet.com. Follow him on the Twitter at Johnny Jet. All the links we just mentioned are there. Uh, you can also find his Instagram, Johnny Jet, same name. And it's a great Instagram. I love looking at your pictures of you and your dad at the racetrack winning big. Yeah. <laughs> Things like that. Big money. <laughs> big money. I'm about to go see him right now for lunch. So, I'm going to have post a great a lunch. Photo. Thank you, John. Thank you. Johnnyjet.com. Always great to talk to you. He's our travel guru. I love Johnny. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. <laughs> James in Burbank. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, James. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. James listened to the radio. Or maybe he's having a conversation. That doesn't sound like me. Or maybe he's listening to another show. Tell you what, we'll put him on hold and take a break. When we come back, we'll see what's going on with the, with James in Burbank and, uh, and all our SDs. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I don't know how. Yeah. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 ask Leo. We were uh, talking to James in Burbank, but the boss. Hey, when the boss calls, James, you got to take it. Yes, Leo. I can't thank you enough for not hanging up on me, but I appreciate it. <laughs> no, we were listening in, and I hope it all works out. <laughs> Well, no, 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 no. I immediately put you on hold. I didn't want to I didn't want to compromise your privacy. Oh, thank you, Leo. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, I know that, you know, Apple pulled all the iPod classics. They're not selling, but yeah. they, they pulled them from the store. I mean, Best Buy, Walmart. I mean, they just recalled them from everywhere. And now they're on eBay, you know, for $500. And I understand why they, they, they pulled them. You know, not well, Apple says they uh, stopped making them because they couldn't get the parts. But why wouldn't they sell what they have? They don't even... They, I think they already did. So this is a... Didn't. Well, I asked him. I went to two Apple stores and I went to Best Buy, and Best Buy said we had to send them back. 
and then they got the Apple Store said, no, we had tons of them, and, and we, we sent them back. Interesting. And they said they didn't even, because that's what they said, we're not making them anymore. I said, well, why don't you sell them until they go out? And he said, no, we, just one day we came in, we sent them all back. I wonder what they're going to do with them. Well, that was my question. I, when I, that's what I didn't know. I understand why they don't make them, but I, why they pulled them. And even, like I said, Best Buy, you cannot find them at any, mm. even on Amazon, they're, they're $500 if you can find them. I, but, would, I would guess uh, that, well, I can't speak for those people who talked to you, but Apple's pretty good about controlling the chain, the supply chain. They knew they were going to cancel them ahead of time. Obviously, they didn't decide that the same moment they announced it. Uh, and I would guess that they stopped manufacturing them some months ago. And while, yeah, maybe they had 20 at that store or 15 in another store, or maybe I doubt there's there's that many in existence out there. Uh. And uh, because Apple's very good at uh, at what we call just in time manufacture. And you don't because it's a cost to a company to make stuff and have it sit on the shelves. Uh, and maybe not sell it. You don't want to have... It's like I, I, when I worked at McDonald's. <laughs> Let me tell you a little story. So did I. <laughs> well, do you remember that the key at McDonald's is you have enough hamburgers for the rush, but you don't want too many because after six minutes, that hamburger is not sellable. You got to get rid of it. You throw it in the waste bin and they count it later and it counts against you as a manager. So the key with them at McDonald's is to make sure you make just the right amount of hamburgers, not too few, not too, you don't want to keep customers waiting, but at the same time, you don't want to waste hamburgers. And I think that was many years ago, as you might imagine, uh, it's been at least five years since I worked at McDonald's, but uh, I would imagine that Apple has an even better system for making sure they don't have too many. Now, what do they do with the old ones? I don't know. That's a very interesting question because my guess is they said, look, if we're going to discontinue, we don't want to have it just selling dribs and drabs out the door. They probably did a calculation. There's, you know, 5,000 left. Uh, we're just going to write those off. I would, it would be great if they donated them to charity. Or so, or even you can't even buy them on their website. You go on Apple. No, no. Once they, this is Apple. Remember, yeah. you're not you're not messing around with, you know, some fly by night company. This is Apple, the most valuable company in the world, and they know exactly what they're doing. And my guess is, somewhere, there is a, a pile of them, um, and they'll probably just take them apart for parts. They've got to keep some, because remember, there are going to be people. I, I include myself. I bought I two years ago. I bought a classic. Maybe it was a, it was only a year ago. I bought a classic because I figured this isn't long for this world. These were the 160 gigabyte iPods. They actually have little tiny spinning hard drives in them. It's my guess, by the way, that that's the part they couldn't get anymore. And uh, I knew that this is these this is you know everything's going solid state. This isn't going to last very long. So I bought one for my car because I love having all that storage, all my songs in my car. Um, People like me, at some point, are going to go back to the Apple store saying, hey, it's not working, and they're going to need to fix it. So my guess is what they did is they just took whatever they had. How, how many do you think they had? 5,000? 10,000? And they're going to keep them for parts. They're going to keep them around so that they can service the people. and Because they don't what, what they don't want to do is, uh, is tell me, well, I'm sorry, you can't fix that anymore. I doubt they're going to take it and plow them under. I'd be very shocked. It has happened. There was a great documentary about Atari. They, uh, Atari really single-handedly ruined video gaming for some years. Nintendo, this is back in the, uh, in the 80s, the Atari 2600 game machine. Uh, Nintendo was starting to kick their butts. One of the reasons the Nintendo Entertainment System was so popular is because Nintendo kept tight control on the games. No bad games. Every game's good. And when you're spending 40 or 50 bucks on a cartridge, you don't want a bad game. Atari didn't care. They said, anybody wants to make a game, we're going to be rich. <laughs> so there were a lot of bad games. And the, the most notoriously awful game on the Atari 2600 was written in six weeks. They had to rush it to time it with the release of Steven Spielberg's movie E.T., so they had to rush it. It was a terrible game. Not only was it buggy, it just wasn't very fun, wasn't very playable. And Atari realized, we're going to crash sales of our system if we let this stick around. So they took all the old cartridges and they disappeared. Flash forward to last year, a documentary company got permission from the town of Alamogordo, New Mexico to dig up their landfill because there have been for years 
rumors that that's what Atari did with them, is plow them under in a landfill in New Mexico. Sure enough, <laughs> in the documentary, I think is on Netflix, they found thousands of E.T. cartridges <laughs> buried in Alag Alamogordo, New Mexico. <laughs> I don't think Apple's plowing those I iPods under. I would. I hope not. You're right. They're very valuable to somebody who wants them. And at the same time, I doubt Apple's going to put them out on eBay either. I think they're just going to keep them for parts. They'll keep them around. And, um, that, I mean, that's my best guess. It's probably fewer than it sounds like. You know, in the Apple, the guy in the Apple store says, yeah, we had a ton of them. What, did, what was that? It's not a thousand. It's probably not a hundred. Yeah, we got 20 of them. Oh, we got 15. We got a ton of them. The Best Buy guy said, yeah, we had to send all five of them back. If you, if you do the math, I suspect there's not more than a few thousand out there. Atari's really, I mean, Atari, Apple's really, they're a lot smarter than Atari. <laughs> let's, let's face it, Apple's pretty smart about this stuff. They don't, they don't make stuff way ahead of time. And you know this because, for instance, it's still hard to get an iPhone 6. They're selling them as fast as they, as they can make them. Not so hard to get an iPod these days. So that's what I think happened to that. Too bad. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I did mention it last year when I bought a, uh, an iPod Classic. I'm pretty sure I mentioned it on the radio. Get your iPod Classics because they're not, they can't possibly be long for this world. 8888 asks Leo, it's a good question. What happened to them? Anybody, look, if you work for Apple and you know, we will, uh, we'll, we'll put a little vocoder on your voice so nobody will recognize your voice. We'll, we'll call you Freddy from Phoenix and you tell us, you can be a leak. What happened to those 160 gig iPods? Those were great. Adam in Pittsburgh, PA, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Hey, Adam. Hey. Um, so I've been thinking about building a PC, and uh, some of it's on sale on like New Age and stuff now, just for a little bit. I'm wondering if I hold off for like Black Friday or Cyber Monday. Usually, that's not. <laughs> But you never know. I mean, if you're new egg, you've gotta you've gotta put some deals up, right, for Black Friday. Might be a great hard drive. Um, that's generally, by the way, when I build first of all, I don't recommend building PCs anymore except for fun. It's a great hobby, it's a fun thing to do. It's not hard, but you're not gonna get such a great deal that you, it'll save you money. If you think about it, Dell buys stuff in greater quantity. The only advantage of building your own PCs that you have absolute control over it. But I ought to remind you the disadvantage is there's no one person to go to for a, if something doesn't work. You have to go right. back to the individual manufacturers. You can make this somewhat better by buying it all from the same company. And Newegg's a great place. Um, Newegg.com. Uh, you can get everything you need at Newegg. Prices are aggressive. You can read the reviews of the products there. And they stand behind. Yeah. They mostly stand behind. I bought a, a phone there and uh, you couldn't return it after two weeks. But... Uh, uh, mostly they stand behind their stuff. Uh, I, you know, I'm, yeah, I bet they will. You can wait a week. What, tell me about what you're doing. Well, I'm, uh, my day job is a systems administrator. So this is a good thing and, for you to do. Cause this is, this is education. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I'm always kind of putting off spending a ton of money for my own stuff here at home. Yeah. Get yourself um, a nice gaming system here. Yeah. Something like that. So I was just looking to get like a little I five with like eight gigs of Ram. Yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, you know, Newegg's not notorious for, like, <laughs> doorbuster specials on, on Black Friday, but they do have specials. Um, okay. And they also have a price. You know what? Somebody's saying, and I think this is true, they have a price matching policy. Call them and say, if I buy this now and you reduce the price next week for Black Friday, can I get the difference? I bet oh, you, you great. I bet you, you yeah. can. I bet you, you can. Yeah, because I had heard that um, unless it's a doorbuster, some places actually up the price a little bit on their non. I know it's terrible. Stuff, I don't. I I stay away from Black Friday. I feel like it, it, this has to be a scam. There's got to be something going on here. Have fun, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I like buying them for Newegg because you just feel like you're getting it all together. And somebody's saying that the price, but the price matching is only on their egg, iron egg specials. I don't know what that means. And uh, Micro Center. If you have a Micro Center, everybody's saying they're going to get great prices at Micro Center. 
I think uh, Black Friday is a scam because you go in there for a $50 television. They got four of them. You have to fight people to get it. And you get it home, it's kind of crappy anyway. It's all about, it's psychology. Black Friday is all about psychology. You think they're not making money on you? I, I think Black Friday is like uh, St. Patrick's Day. Better left to the amateurs. Just my opinion. Just my opinion. Some people love it. It's a sporting event. Go do it if you like it for a sporting event. Uh, you're not going to catch me anywhere near a Best Buy on Friday. I already got my Black Friday special. A ginormous phone. Ginormous. It's Halloween for adults. No, Halloween is Halloween for adults. Black Friday is 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 uh, wrestling. Is WWE for adults? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't really need to use my A7S to record 444 video or whatever. I can live without that. Yes, Nexus 6. Nexus 6. Yeah, if you're, yeah, so this is what I do. I uh, stock up on extra routers, motherboards, RAM, so I don't have to go anywhere near a store on Black Friday. I got I got three extra phones and just in case. You treat tech like I treat wine. Mm. I treat wine like you treat wine. Mm. <laughs> oh, okay. You're stocked up. Mm. You're stocked oh, up we on are everything. stocked up. Over a yes. hundred bottles in my cellar now. In the larder. In the larder. Things in the larder. <laughs> we only got, which is ridiculous, <clears throat> but it's great at the same time. It's called a Coravin. C O R A V I N. And what it is, it's, it's a long needle with a little argon uh, capsule, argon gas capsule attached. And you, it's a thin needle, and you stick it in the cork. Oh. And then you pump some argon gas in there, and you can pour a bottle, you can pour a glass from a bottle, replace the oxygen with argon, which is obviously, you know, non-reactive, Withdraw the needle, and I guess the cork reseals itself. It's a thin yes. enough needle, and you can have, so the whole idea is you can have a glass of wine from any bottle in your cellar, and it's still cellarable. You could still leave it there. <laughs> so uh, we tried it with a lovely 1990 Dunn Vineyards uh, cab. It tasted fabulous. We drank about half the box. Because Lisa and I, one glass. We're not, we're not trying to get drunk or anything. It's usually just the two of us. So we each had a glass. I didn't even finish mine. I gave it the rest of mine. And then withdrew the long needle. It's sitting there. And then we're going to uh, wait a while, a few days, and see if the wine's still good. And I think it will be because the argons yes. replaced the oxygen. I, don't, I, can't, I don't think it'll oxidate. I heard about that. That's the entire concept. Like if you're like, you know what? I think this might be better in 10 years. Right. See. How it's, it was designed, so I think it was never... designed probably for vintners who want right. to sample the wines as they're, as they're aging. Um, but it's also good for people. It's expensive. It's 300 bucks. So it's not, but if it, and then you have to buy capsules, they'll last a few, you know, I don't know how many bottles they're going to last, but they say, I don't know, five to 10 or something, but, um, the capsules are a few bucks each, but the idea is great because you can, um, we don't, we'll never finish a bottle. I have, and then, so that's the other thing that you do is make vinegar. So I, so Dvorak, cause I got this time was stupid. I bought this. Some William Sonoma vinegar maker. He said, no, 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 that's a scam. So he said, what you want to do is just whenever you don't finish a bottle, just stuff some pa a paper towel in it to keep the flies out, but a little air oxygen has to go in, and you put it somewhere dark, and you leave it for months. And then after a while, it, it turns into vinegar. You sniff it, and he says, you'll know immediately if it's good or bad. Sniff it. Mm, okay. You taste it. Mm, well, that's good. And there's your vinegar. He said, that's all you do. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of vinegar. Because <laughs> well, we never vinegar. finish a bottle. We never finish a bottle. So. 
lasagna, as always, Mike B, was fabulous. I think Dvorak took home about eight more pieces. <laughs> Dvorak and Alex Lindsay came over and uh, devoured a considerable bunch, but uh, lasagna is big. Even for four people, we don't put a dent in it. So I talked to you about my Jack Irwins. Now, these are my favorite, but the nice thing about Jack Irwin is you can send them back. But beautifully handmade shoes, leather, leather soles. Look at that. Gorgeous. Oh, perfect in every way. Just very high quality shoes. And then you look at them online, you buy them online. And in fact, the, the, that one is the, that, this is the one, isn't it? But I, when I got it, I thought, oh, it's okay, but easy to send it back. Just, you know. And the prices are about a quarter of what you would pay in the store for these shoes. I'll show you, show you the ones I'm definitely keeping. Love these. JackIrwin.com slash twit, and you'll get some of my picks. These, oh, look at these wingtips. These are gorgeous. Just, this is a work of art. They use uh, leathers from uh, uh, Italy. The shoes are handmade in Spain. Made by hand, and they're, and they're the price, when you see the price, I think these are 195 bucks. Now, you might say, well, that's a lot. But if you've only been buying sneakers, this is a step up, okay? These are really good shoes. It would probably cost 800 bucks in the store. Beautiful shoes from Jack Irwin. I want you to try them out. J-A-C-K-E-R-W-I-N.com. And by the way, they come beautifully packaged. You get a, a shoe bag for traveling, some extra insoles. This is nice. You're just going to love these shoes. All right, all right, all right. One more pair to show you. And I thought, and this is for you. I want you to give me your re reaction on this, Heather, because I'm not sure whether I should wear these or not. I know they're all the rage. These are men's boots, shoe boots. What do you think? Is this for me? Okay, the microphone's in the way. You think I should wear this? What do you think? Isn't that beautiful? Jack Irwin. See, I'm going to keep these. JackIrwin.com slash twit to get my holiday picks. Jack Irwin shoes, great shoes, amazing, beautiful shoes at amazing prices. JackIrwin.com slash twit. A great gift if you want your guy to kind of up his game. JackIrwin.com slash twit. All right, back to work. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet. Home theater, digital photography, and of course, smartphones. 8888-ASK. Leo is the phone number. 888-827-5536. We have a great website that's free and open to all. You don't need to sign up. I don't want your email address. Keep it to yourself. I don't want your money. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. Uh, techguylabs.com. Everything we talk about on the show is there. Links. In fact, what we do is we we, we get the, the notes up pretty quickly. Now, I think... Um, James DeRuvo, who normally takes our notes, is uh, taking the day off. He's got, um, is it Boy Scouts or graduation? Something's going on. He'll be he'll be finishing those up tonight. Uh, and then Josh Windish in my office will take it. He'll add audio and video from each show. You can go to any hour of any show. You can go to any show, of course, any day, and even any question. And if you go right to the question, you, the, you can listen to the audio right from that point or the video right from that point. You could see the text, all the links. You can even add your own thoughts. And I do hope you'll do that. I, I won't be insulted if you said, well, Leo's not quite right on this. There's a better way to do it because that's the idea. We want to make this a beautiful, rich, useful tool for anybody to search to find the information they need, whether they watch the show or not. TechGuyLabs.com. And it is uh, unlike, uh, I know a lot of uh, websites, you pay a fee or whatever to join. We don't do that. We've got great sponsors. We don't need to do that. TechGuyLabs.com. Uh, Corky, Long Beach, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Corky. Hi, Leo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much. What can I do for you? My question is about smartphones. I currently have a feature phone. Uh, I know I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> hey, but you know what? Your battery life's probably great. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. I mean, we're lucky if we get a day out of these things. Yeah. Uh, next month, I'm going to Spain, and I have oh. heard you talk about certain types of phones yeah. 
CDMA, TDMA, GSM. Oh, boy, you know the acronyms. Well, you know, at the time I did not know I was going to Spain. So ah. now I need to take notes, listen carefully to you. So um, I'm going to give you a website uh, that's okay. a good thing to know about. It's called Prepaid with Data. Dot wiki, uh, I think, dot com. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, let me just check and make sure I got it right. Prepaid with data. And the idea is it's a wiki where people have uh, gone and put information on buying data sims internationally. So you can go by country. You can see what people's experience has been. Let me talk kind of in general about the idea of what you're, what you're interested in here. There's two ways you use a phone these days. Uh, of course, you use it to make calls. And because you'll be in Spain, uh, if you continue, if you take your phone to Spain and it works in Spain, and it probably will, almost all phones will work overseas use, using something called roaming, your phone number will still work. If people call your local number, your Long Beach number, your phone will ring in Spain in the middle of the night. And you'll have to pick it up and say, don't call me, I'm in Spain. Do you know how much this is costing? Because it can be a dollar a minute or more uh, because roaming is expensive. So if, if you're going to use your phone overseas, of course, the first thing to do is call your carrier and say, I want an international calling plan. But it gets worse if you have a smartphone. If you send text messages, that can really be expensive. Even receiving a text message can be very expensive when you're roaming. And then, of course, if you have a smartphone and you're using data, that can really add up. In fact, smartphones will get mail. They don't care. They don't know. They'll get mail. They'll be downloading maps. They'll be doing all sorts of stuff, even though that data may cost you a lot of money. So there's, two th there's, there's a couple of things to consider. One is, will my phone work? And then the other is, how much am I going to be paying to use this? Are you going to get a smartphone for traveling? Well, this would be a good opportunity to force myself. <laughs> don't for you, don't, you don't have to. I'll, I'll tell you why you might want one. Okay. I love having a smartphone when I travel because I can never get lost again. I love getting in a new city and wandering, but then you have to figure out, how do I, where's my hotel? Where am I? <laughs> and the beauty of a smartphone is you just fire up Google Maps and you say, navigate me home and it'll tell you walking directions to get home or how to get a bus or a subway and get home and that's awesome yeah wonderful yeah very nice there's a wonderful app called city mapper that does uh, mass transit and trains yeah, all over the world and, and it's just great you say here's my hotel what's the best way to get to the tower of london it'll tell you three different routes tell you how much it'll cost It'll even give you directions to go to the bus stop. So it, it does make traveling better. You can make, you know, you can look for restaurants in your area. I use Zagat and other restaurant guides to figure out what the best restaurants are. You can even have your guidebook on your phone. There are a lot of great online guidebooks. So in general, a smartphone can be really a useful tool uh, as you're traveling around. But remember, all of this is going to use data. So uh, you need to have, ideally, you would have a GSM phone. That's the dominant technology around the world. However, if you're on Verizon or Sprint, which are CDMA carriers, in most cases, they will still work. There are there are a few places they won't work at all, but there are some. So that's first thing to figure out is, who's your carrier right now? Verizon. Yeah. Verizon also sells international, or they call them world phones, phones that are guaranteed to work. I'll give you a good example, the iPhone. The iPhone and Verizon uh, will work anywhere. In fact, you can even, if the SIM slot is unlocked, which means you can put one of these prepaid data cards in uh, and make your phone a European phone, a Spanish phone. Uh -huh. So let me explain that a little bit. The personality of the phone on, on all but Sprint, on Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, the personality of the phone is determined by a little chip that you go in the, goes in a slot in the phone. It's called the SIM card, about as big as your fingernail. Uh, that SIM card has your phone number on it. It's your account. It's It tells the phone who you are. And, of course, it's how you get billed and all of that. When you get to a, a country like uh, England or Spain, you can, in fact, you can usually do it at the airport, buy a local SIM card. You put that in. Now you're going to have a local number. You can buy one with data. And sometimes it's very inexpensive. Uh, in Europe, for instance, 3 offers uh, unlimited data for a month for 30 pounds. It's very inexpensive. That's where this prepaid with data wikia will be useful. That's what this is all about is who the care, who the people are that sell cards in Spain, what the prices are that you could expect, 
Uh, Spain, for instance, I'm seeing has four network operators, Movistar, Vodafone, Orange, and Yoigo. Um, they, you know, it tells you what frequencies they're on. You want to make sure you get a phone that works. Sometimes frequencies vary from the U.S. to other countries. Uh, you can see where you can get a SIM card, what it will cost for you, and so forth. So uh, this is a useful, and I'll put this in the show notes. It's prepaidwithdata.wikia, W-I-K-I-A dot com. That's a useful place to go. You can also, in fact, we're going to put a link to a Rick Steves article on using your smartphone internationally. Rick's great about travel. I love his stuff. Um, do you want to keep your phone number? Yes, I do. Okay, so you won't want to put a SIM in because that gets rid of your phone number. Okay. Verizon's data, international data and calling is not the best in the world. If you are thinking of traveling or you're planning to travel a lot, I would take a look at T-Mobile. T-Mobile uh, offers free international texting and data. Uh, unlimited free international texting and data. The catch is the data is slow. It's 2G, but it's still free. And it's enough to get your mail. If you're in an emergency to get a map, you might have to wait a little, you know, wait a minute instead of 30 seconds or 20 seconds. Uh, to find out where you are. But that could be really helpful. So T-Mobile is a great choice for travelers. I always carry a phone with T-Mobile okay, as I you travel. Know, you did say, do I want to keep my phone number? I'm willing to use a different phone number for the two and a half weeks. Yeah, yeah, you won't give up your phone number forever. But putting in a SIM from Spain would give you a Spanish number. Now, that might be an issue or it might not be. If you want people to call you from the States, you'll either need to give them your new Spanish number, which will be very long because it'll have the Spanish country code and all of that. Okay. Or have your phone, your old phone, forward to the new number, which you can do. But then you'll be paying the full freight for that phone call through oh. Verizon. So you see this is a complicated subject. It is. Hang on. I'll take, we got to take a break, but do hang on. I'll, I'll let you answer, ask questions because I kind of monologued on that one when we come back. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Orange. So this website, and let me put this in the show notes. Prepaid with... Yeah, I mean, I think a Google Google Voice can't be used overseas, but um, it can have. You can use it for forwarding. I don't know actually if it can. It worked. Oh yeah, you can leave a message. There you go. Doctor Mom says, "Here's a good thing, and this is a good idea. Use get a Google Voice number. Don't forward it to your phone because it won't work. But let them call call the Google Voice number and leave a message saying, hey, 'Hey, I'm in Spain right now.'" But please leave a message, and I'll be checking these every time I get back to the hotel. Because you can use Wi-Fi to check them for free, and almost all the hotels have Wi-Fi, and get your messages. And you can even use the Wi-Fi to call them back with Skype or something else, and that's going to be the second half of this conversation. Corky's going to Spain. By the way, that's where most cork comes from, you know. <laughs> I did not know that. Yes. Didn't you read Ferdinand the Bull? Uh, no, I didn't. When you were a child? I must have missed that. He sleeps under a cork tree. Cork comes from Spain, yeah. So, uh, given your name, I think you should go look for some cork trees. Okay. Another <laughs> item. I don't know if the corks grow on the trees or they're part of the trunk. I would like you to investigate. Okay, we'll do it. <laughs> Meanwhile, here's another tip. And then I, I said I was going to let you ask a question, but, but one more thing, because Leo can't stop talking. Wi-Fi is your friend. Wi-Fi is nowadays almost everywhere. Your hotel will probably have it. Coffee shops often have it for the price of a cup of coffee. So, And Wi-Fi is, think of it as free data, because once you've paid for it with a cup of coffee or if your hotel charges you, you can go crazy. It's not limited. So all smartphones support Wi-Fi. And so the idea is do as much of your data stuff as you can ahead of time while you're on the Wi-Fi. For instance, Google Maps will let you say, download the maps of this area. And you have them on your phone. Now you don't have to use data to get them. Uh -huh. So there's, all, there's a lot of tricks. Uh, uh, so I highly recommend that. Um, questions. What, what do you want to know? Yeah, you know, while I was waiting, I do recall that uh, I remembered that you have talked about buying a cell phone you in could Europe. Do that. Yeah, you could buy an unlocked phone, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I'm thinking I probably ought to do that because most of my phone calling will be locally and maybe one or two, if I need to, emergency back to the States. Right. Well, if you if you take a, ca a phone that has a SIM card, you can you don't even need to buy a phone. You can just buy, buy a SIM card, okay. and that makes it a Spanish phone. Okay. So, I, you know, the truth is... Uh, buying a phone is only if you don't want to get a phone that works and you don't have a phone that works in that country. But since you're you're looking at buying a smart, do you want to keep your feature phone? This sounds like this is an opportunity to get a smartphone. Yeah, I, I am going to make the big leap. And I, yes, I will get a smartphone. And I think now is a good time uh, by, b to get a smartphone before you go because you want to get used to it. Yes. You want to learn what you need. And learn how to use it. You don't want to be futzing around with it in Seville. <laughs> right. So um, are you are you uh, uh, leaning towards an iPhone? Or, uh, do you care? An Android phone? A Windows I, phone? At this point, I don't really care. <laughs> what do your friends use? Because you may get some help from them. Uh, iPhones, Androids. Okay, um, so it's a mix. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, for a first time, iPhone's great, and uh, iPhone from Verizon happens to work internationally very well. That is a great selling point. Yep. Uh, you can put a SIM in or not. If you want to stay with Verizon, the problem with Verizon is that, that their data plans, uh, European data plans, aren't, aren't the cheapest, but they're not horrible. Uh, and if you're very careful, very careful about using Wi-Fi whenever you can, you won't need it. In fact, what you'll do, and I recommend this, is turning off data roaming uh, as you travel and turn it on only when needed. Like, I'm stuck in the middle of Madrid and I don't know where I am. Okay, okay. That way you won't accidentally run up a big data bill. And there have been stories, and they are not apocryphal, of people having ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 data bills oh coming God. back from Europe. And usually the company will forgive it, but or at least cut it in half, but you don't want that. No, no. So so there, you'll see in all smartphones there's a setting, turn off, you have bo you can turn off voice roaming and you can turn off data roaming. At the very least, turn off uh, data roaming. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think the iPhone 6 uh, would be a very nice choice for your first smartphone. You can't go wrong with an iPhone. It's the dominant platform right now. Okay. I happen to like Android, but I like messing around with my phone. and uh, And maybe that's not your highest priority at this point. Okay, well, um, I will be buying a smartphone, so thank you for all of the advice. Good. And I hope I haven't made it worse. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Thank you very much. I'm told half the cork now comes from Portugal, so while you're there, go to Portugal. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Corky. All right. Okay. Take you. care. Have a great time, by the way. Oh, I'd love to be going to Spain. Right now, especially. Wouldn't it be beautiful? 8888 Ask Leo. Chris is in Toledo, not Spain. Ohio. Hi, Chris. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, how you doing, Leo? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing okay. Got a question for you. Uh, recently upgraded my TV to uh, a 4K. Wow, yeah? And Yep. You like it? And, uh, yes, very much. LG 4K TV. Very nice. Uh, my last TV was a, a Sony Bravia. It was a 42-inch. It was kind of old or whatever. Uh, However, at the time you bought it, that was the top of the line. Yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Now, here's here's the big question here. Uh, Mike says, the 4K is a smart TV. And uh, recently, I looked at my uh, cable bill, and I really uh, noticed that uh, my data kind of shot up. Yeah. Do you watch so Netflix? Netflix, Hulu. Yeah. Those are the two main ones. So, you know what happens? <laughs> Netflix steps up the bandwidth to use to utilize. Netflix does offer 4K, not a lot. House of Cards was shot in 4K, and the second season yeah. was uh, was streamed in 4K. Who's your uh, Who's your uh, internet service provider? It's a local uh, local cable provider, Buckeye Cable. Okay, you might ask them. I mean, you have you, you obviously if the price went up, the cost went up, you must have used more data, um, and. It is probably the case if you're, I don't know about Hulu, but certainly Netflix uh, is adaptive. It'll use as much uh, data as it feels it needs if it saw a really high quality TV. Well, your old TV wasn't even HD, was it? What's that again? Was your old TV HD? Yeah, it went oh, it to was. a 1080i. Okay. I mean, most, and most of the, uh, most I'm uh, watching is Hulu. And yeah. It's like about. 
Hulu, I don't think. Go, I know Hulu doesn't do 4K, and it probably doesn't even do 1080p. I bet you it's 720p or 1080i. So, right. but it may be. It, it pro, you know, all of these guys want to be adaptive because if they see you have the bandwidth and the TV to display higher quality, they're going to give you higher quality. So that absolutely can happen. Your your bill goes up. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know also on Netflix, they do, you're able to adjust the, the bandwidth, you know, like good, better, or best, or whatever. I yeah, know. you'll see it because they'll put dots and they'll say, oh, I see, oh, yeah, oh, let's go all the way here. So right. that would be my guess. Um, I don't, I doubt your, your uh, internet provider breaks it down by the traffic, but more and more of us are, and you know, you may even unconsciously be watching more TV because it looks better. True. Right. I know. Let's see. Let's watch another Orange is the New Black. Let's watch another one. Oh, House of Cards season two. Let's watch the whole thing in one night. And suddenly your bill <laughs> through the roof. Yeah, usually I just catch up on the main TV show that I on Hulu. Uh, I usually yeah. watch. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, that's my guess. I don't. Uh, I don't know, of course. And you could ask them. They might be able to break it down for you. But uh, it's not unusual when you get a higher quality TV and you start spending more time watching it, and you get. Uh, you know, if if you're if 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 Netflix noticed that your TV's better quality, it will start spending sending more data down the tube, and that will cost you. Now you could go in the settings, and tell Netflix, and you have to do this on the web. No, don't do that. That'll save you some money, but it'll also look worse. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. No. Da -da 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 Now, let me sign into Netflix and see where we set that. Netflix is uh would it be in the settings here? Manage profiles, your account. Do, 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 do. You have a streaming plan, no DVD plan, social settings, playback settings. There you go. So right there in the playback settings, you can change. I didn't know you could turn this off. That's good. I don't like that feature. That's the binge watching checkbox. Play next episode automatically. So you can choose how much data it's using. And it could be as much as 3 gigabytes an hour for HD, 7 gigabytes for Ultra HD. You have an Ultra HD TV, so it might have turned it up to 7 gigabytes an hour. Dude, unless you had, you know, unlimited, I would be very, you know, careful about that. Um, on the other hand, I always want it to be high. Most people probably leave it at auto. That's Netflix sensing what, you, what your capabilities are. So that's uh, that's good to know. That's very good to know. Yeah, I wish it would fix your your ISP's quality. Now he must have an unusual ISP because most ISPs do not bill you for consumption. That's that's kind of unusual. Most of the time, it, you know, it's a flat rate. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, I also am built to perform. I'm tap dancing right now, Chris and. I do want you to talk to Chris. Let's go to Greg in Essex, UK. Hi, Greg. Hey. Yeah, hello. You all right? It's good to talk to you. How are things in Essex? Um, things are brilliant. It's a bit cold, but it's yeah. quite nice. Yeah. Uh, we had such a good time in the UK last month. Yeah. It was so much fun. What I, can I, I did send, you, I did send um, Steve an email on security now, but you must not have got around to it yet. But um, did you check out any of the tours around here? I, I did. Uh, what did we do? We had a lot of fun. I can't remember. It was a blur. We were only there four days. But I did get... Uh, you mentioned the walking tours and things like that. No, there was um, there's one that you should have checked out. I think you would have liked it. The London Loo Tour. <laughs> I'll pass on the London Loo Tour, but thank you. <laughs> what, can, what can I do for you, Greg? <laughs> um, well, firstly, I have to say I agree with you. The Black Friday stuff is barbaric. I, do do I you do do you do that in in England? Do you do Black Friday? Um, I don't know other people. Do I don't it, think you would because it's Thanksgiving is a U.S. holiday, right? So, um, there is some shops doing it, but quite frankly, I want them to be fighting over my money, not me fighting over giving my money to them. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not going to be fighting for anything. Oh, it's crazy! It's crazy! 
Um, yeah. But, you know, I think I really think of it here in the States as a sporting event. People get yeah. in line. At, they go in the 4 a.m. They're they're fighting each other. People every year, people get hurt. Um, it, and, you know, I don't I'm not convinced those are such great deals. They're usually a, a handful of items at that price and they may not even be the best uh, stuff. So maybe you're getting maybe you're getting some good deals. But is it worth getting beat up over it? I don't think so. <laughs> Well, there is a couple of good shops doing um, some deals around here, but um, they're not really. There's not going to be a lot of fist fights going on, so <laughs> it's not. Really, it's not. A, you know, I'm not going to buy doing it. Well, so. one of the things that Black Friday is global is that uh, many online shops will offer deals in honor yeah. of Black Friday, and you could take advantage of those uh, in the UK as well. I'm sure. Yeah, I did see them. Um, yeah. So, my question: Do you mind if I get to it? Please do. Okay. Um, essentially, I'm looking for a Bluetooth headset and over an over ear one, so um, I don't really get along well with earbuds. So um, I'm looking for something with Bluetooth, and essentially, I, lift, I listen to stuff like metal, rock, a um, bit of classical. Ah, so you want Bluetooth music buds? Um, well, headphones, do, headphones. Or over my ears. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, because I'm trying to get into Android Wear, and now they've got the feature where you can sync to the music onto that. Right. Yeah, the watch, so, um, I don't know how much music the watch can hold, but it might hold an album's worth, right? Yeah, a couple, um, I think there's about four gigs on each watch. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. So um, CNET did an article, the best stereo Bluetooth headphones of 2014. I'm going to put that in the show notes. They just came out with this uh, a couple of days ago. Um, yeah. They liked the Beats Wireless. Those are $379. Bucks. Uh, yeah, Bose also like makes some Beats. Sony um, we tried, and I really like the Parrot Zix, Z-I-K, but they're $400. They call them the Porsche of Bluetooth headphones. Uh, I have played with those, and I, I liked them quite a bit. Um, so yeah. there's some good choices here. Uh, you know, good headphones are going to set you back some money. They're, the, my, my budget is between around 150 and 200 All right. 200 pounds. So. Okay. I've had the Audio Technica Bluetooths, which I like quite a bit. Nokia also makes, or used to make them. I guess Monster is now uh, making them. But boy, the price-wise, it doesn't look like uh, you know there are many in your in your range. And I, I right. guess that's just because over-the-ear headphones tend to be kind of pricey. Here's a pair um, that's not quite over-the-ear. <laughs> they're they're they actually are literally over the ear, but they have a little in a protrusion that goes into your ear from Plantronics that are and your price point. The Backbeat Fit. These are more sport oriented. They go around the back of your head. Um, Beats also has something uh, similar that go over your ear. You, you do you do you want an over the ear cup? Um, yeah, I, I've had a um, AT, the Audio Technica ATH M50s. Yeah, those are the ones I, I've used, and I like those. Yeah. Yeah, I like them quite well until I broke them. But, uh, uh, yeah, I still have mine, or maybe no, I might have lent them to my son. And that means they're long gone. Um, chat room Hodor in the chat room, uh, but it says Hodor, Hodor. No, he says decent pair of Bluetooth noise reducing Sony headphones. On sale for ninety nine bucks at Costco, which is one of those warehouse stores in the states. Ninety nine dollars, uh, not a bad uh, bad price for uh, for Sony uh, over the years. So there are some choices out there if you shop around. I'll put the link to these reviews in the chat room. They did mention Saul Republic, which used to be partnered with Motorola. Um, they make something called the Trax Air wireless headphones for one hundred forty five dollars. Um, and they said the sound quality is decent on uh, those. It really is the case, I think, that uh, you need to spend a few hundred dollars on headphones to get really excellent sound quality. I wonder, though, with Bluetooth, there are Bluetooth high-quality sound profiles. You don't want to use the Bluetooth headset profile. That's designed for phone quality. And the music will start to sound like this. But there is another uh, profile for Bluetooth called A2DP. That's a stereo high-quality um, Bluetooth setting. I wonder, though, how high-fidelity that could be. I don't know if Bluetooth has that much bandwidth. So it may be that it, there's no point in getting super great headphones if you're going to listen to them uh, in Bluetooth. Um, anyway, that's a great review, and I thank the chat room for passing that along. Uh, Dave Carnoy, best stereo Bluetooth headphones of 2014. It was updated yesterday on uh, CNET, or the day before yesterday on CNET.com. Give you some ideas. 
Uh, and nice to have you listening in the UK. That's wonderful. Moving on to Simon in Gardena, California. Hi, Simon. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Simon! Come to the phone, Simon. Hello? Yes, yes. <laughs> He's running. Simon probably uh, made, a, made a little pit stop before the uh, call. Hello, Simon. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. Uh, well, uh, lately, like, uh, every, every time I, I uh, log into YouTube or uh, some other uh, website, if they have any uh, video, short video or something, I try to watch it, I get this green screen. I yes. get sound and everything, but no... Yeah, that's not unusual, and, and and usually that's because you have a setting on your Windows machine uh, to accelerate video, but it's not working right. And the older machines couldn't actually put video on the screen the same way they'd put other bits on the screen. It was just too demanding. So these video cards had a checkbox, and you'll find these in the device driver if you go to your device manager on your Windows machine, and then you click on the video card, you'll find a checkbox for Accelerate Video. And what that does is it actually blasts the video into video memory, bypassing the CPU, bypassing the, um, gen the, the, you know, it doesn't generate stuff on the screen the same way everything else on the screen is done. It blasts it on. The problem is if that doesn't work, and it may not be working on your system, well, all you get is a green box. So a couple of things you should do. First of all, make sure you've got the latest driver for your video card. Uh, running Windows Update often will be sufficient, but you might, you know, if you could figure out what kind of video you have, and again, this is a question of going to the device manager um, in your Windows machine. If it's, I, I suspect it's an older machine, so you right-click on My Computer, select Properties, go to the device manager, look at your video card, figure out which video card you've got. Make sure that you've got the latest drivers from that company. But then you might also want to just, if there's a checkbox on the Accelerate video, uncheck it or check it, depending on probably what you're going to do is uncheck it. If it's checked, that's where you get the green video. Um, it's not, it's, it's from the old, old days. Nowadays, stuff's fast enough. You don't need to do that. No special tricks are required to put video on the screen. It's something we do all the time. You might also make sure you got the latest version of Flash as well. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, Leo Laporte, the tech guy, making eight-year-olds laugh coast to coast. <laughs> it's Dick DiBartolo, mad, maddest writer. He is an extremely talented Burper. Wow. When what was the oh, year that burper. you Oh, okay, burper. Burper. right. Yeah, burper. <laughs> when was the year that you and Sarah recorded that? Uh boy, 1980. Wow. Did you ever think those belches would last 34 years? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I've gone seltzer. through about 5 <laughs> uh, it's about 5 and a half million <laughs> bottles of Tums. <laughs> no relief. Dick DiBartolo is Mad Magazine's maddest writer. He has been for a few years. He's also our gadget guy. We call him our Gizwiz because he brings us wizard gizmos and gadgets each and every week. Hello, Dickie D. Leah, how you doing? I'm well, well, well. Good. I have something up your alley since you're a cook. Last week you were telling us about your amazing tomato sauce. Yes. So do you do any sous vide cooking? No, and I'm very intrigued. There was a big article in the New York Times this week. Yes. I, I saw this thing at um, Engadget Expand, and I thought, this is a very weird gadget that no one's ever heard of. And then I opened the New York Times, as you did, and it's it's cooking in warm water, yeah, not hot. which I've been doing for years uh, <laughs> as boil and bag. No, but this isn't boiling. That's what's interesting about That's, this. Yes. Yeah. And, and so it's a, and they were talking about how these units used to cost fifteen hundred dollars. And well, they were used by restaurants and, primarily. Yes. In fact, yes. they say if you get a perfect steak in a restaurant, you wonder how do they get a perfect steak every time. It's because behind the scenes they're using sous vide which is a French uh, technique 
of cooking at fairly low temperatures in water in sealed bags. For a fairly long time. Right. So the, the company that was displaying at the end gadget affair is called Nomiku. Okay. And their unit is $299 online. And But she told me that you can cook in a matter, some things cook in minutes, some in hours. Occasionally there's something you'll leave overnight. Right. Yeah. And, yeah but and it, it's did. safe, right? It's not <laughs> Yes, it's not yes, going yes. to poison me, is it? No, it's very safe. It has to be cooked uh, in a in a sealed plastic bag. But as the article pointed out, people used to think you had to get it like a plastic bag sealer. But if you put it in like a Ziploc or one of those commercial bags, as you lower it in the water, the air will go toward the top. And just before it goes under the water, you seal the bag. And then you look uh, in your recipe thing, it'll tell you the exact temperature what to dial. What kinds of temperatures are we talking? 100 degrees, 200 degrees? It's not you boiling. Know, she, the, in the video that I was watching, they were cooking something at 72 degrees. What? Yeah. That's not cooking. That's, <laughs> that's warming that's, it up. Not even warming it up. That, that is showering it. It's showering it. So this was, a, I remember this because this was a Kickstarter project, Nomiku. Uh, yes, and exactly. I was very intrigued by this. Well, the thing is, I was talking to the people via the, their uh, chat function online, and... By the way, that isn't 72 Fahrenheit. That must be 72 Celsius. That could be. Yeah, which that, is more, that, that's more like 150 degrees. I think oh, this that, is that always like sub-boiling, but more than 100. Yeah. It's got to be warm. But the thing is, if you don't mind slow cooking, my recommendation is to slowly wait for your unit to come <laughs> because right now it's two ninety nine dollars yeah. shipping in four to six weeks. Ah. However, in the spring, they are coming out with a Wi-Fi model wow. that, that has many new features right now. Why would I need, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do I need my sous vide pot to be online? You can, da you can download new recipes. Oh. If, if there's a software update, just uh, do it via Wi-Fi. Do you Wi -Fi. use your phone to, to control this thing? Uh, you know what? I you know that's an interesting question. I don't know. Some of these, and some of these, you're, uh, you can use your smartphone. You can even uh, start it cooking while you're at work. That's why. You oh, there you go. Online. Yeah. There you go. And yeah. I guess you can tune in and see what temperature it's at. Yeah. The, the other thing is the new one that's coming in the spring. Right now, this, this sits on the edge of a pot or a container, which you have. The, the thing itself is like a little hand unit, and you slide it on the edge of a pot. Right now, the thermostat faces in toward the cooking, surf, uh, cooking area. The new one, it faces the outside oh, of well, the pot. Oh, well, thank goodness, because I just can't live with it facing the wrong way. Exactly. Yeah. And it has a bigger screen and it's going to be the same price. So the 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 one you would want to my mind would be the Nomiku Wi-Fi model coming in the Now, screen. have you ever done this? I have never no, I was watching them do it at the show and it just seemed unnatural that one <laughs> put like <laughs> put, put That's something one in word. a Yes, put something in a plastic bag and put it at the bottom of a pot and then watch water circulate around it, you know. So I, I'm the uh, kind of person I I'm have, the kind of person that in a supermarket I picked up a box and I said, "Are they kidding?" and I threw it back and my friend said, "What are you so upset about?" I said, F microwave for 15 minutes? Who has that kind of time? <laughs> so, see, the idea of sous vide is like a crock pot or something. You 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 go to work yes. and you let it sit in, in a warm bath. All day, yes, all day. Yes, yes. No bubbles, just a warm no bath. Bubbles. And uh, I ordered an un unusual uh, sous vide uh, device, another one of those kind of Kickstarter things. It, it's not going to come for a few months, but it both cools and heats. So you can put the oh. meat in or whatever you're going to cook, and it will chill it so it stays fresh, and then it will oh. turn on and start cooking it. And it also uh, works with your uh, iPhone or your Android phone. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, but if I die of food poisoning, uh, you'll know why. <laughs> Actually, Lisa says I'm not eating that. But what you oh, would, really? Yeah. Well, what you see, it doesn't brown anything. But what you would do maybe is sous vide a steak, 131 degrees. And then you degrees, have to take it out. Then you put it on the grill or the frying pan. And you brown it. 
You sear it quickly. But it, it's supposed to be like the ultimate in cooking. Yeah, well, your meat's relaxed. It's been taking a bath all day. <laughs> and that's really a good thing. <laughs> Dick T. Martello's website is kisswiz.biz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z dot B-I-Z. Do I have to light candles? Maybe a little incense? Anything for the... Oh, that's good. Yeah. That, you, you know what? Don't you have a, a, a jacuzzi? You could just try that. <laughs> I do. I could put it in the hot tub, let it sit. There you go. I think it's the right temperature. I think seal the bag. Good. Seal the bag well. Well. <clears throat> Uh, gizwiz.biz, that's where you can find all the details about the Nomiku and everything else. All the gadgets Dix talks about on uh, World News Now, on ABC, on our show. He also does a podcast called The Gizwiz every week on this uh, network, 5 p.m. Pacific time at twit.tv on Thursdays with the redoubtable Chad Johnson, OMG Chad. Uh, all of that stuff at gizwiz.biz. And then, while you're there, just there's a, there's a couple other links you might want to click on that page. There's one that the what is it called? The the Mad Garbage? The Gar... Uh, mad Garbage. Mad exactly. Garbage. Exactly. Which is old stuff that Dick has been had lying around in his storage locker. <laughs> yeah. Just and for 80, uh, what are we up to? About $91,000. There's, there's, yeah. no, there's no I, meat in there, but there's uh, but there's like old, there's classic Mads, autograph stuff. Yeah. Match game questions, things like that. You can also play the What the Heck Is It contest, a chance to identify, or rightly or wrongly, a close-up picture of a gadget or gizmo, and win an autographed copy of Mad from Dick. It's a lot of fun. Gizwiz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z -I -Z dot B-I-Z. Thank you, Dickie D. Thank you, sir. Hey, that's it for me, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great geek week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on MacBreak Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today in our weekly roundtable show This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.